Welcome everybody to the complete and unabridged lore of La Mulana. Um, specifically, we're planning on talking about La Mulana 1. So anything that comes up from La Mulana 2 directly, anything that's modified in the first game by La Mulana 2, anything that's introduced in La Mulana 2, basically, we're pretending it doesn't exist. So we're trying to look at this exclusively from the perspective of La Mulana 1 in a bubble. Um, if you've played La Mulana 2, you're familiar with what I'm talking about here in that the game kind of retcons a lot of information, it changes it. Uh, by the end of this presentation, hopefully, if you're a fan of La Mulana 2 and you're familiar with the story in La Mulana 2, um, hopefully what I will convince you is that there actually is no retcon. That everything that happens in La Mulana 2 more or less was... Uh, pre-described pre uh, directly from La Mulana 1, and that the notes are there if you kind of already know you're looking for them. It's one of those cyclic, circular things where if you already know what the outcome is, you can see all of the information present originally, um, which I think is a sign of a good, um, kind of a good world building, is that a lot of times you're presented with information that you don't even realize the full impact of until you until you know everything there is to know. So anyway, uh, obviously, it should come as no surprise to you that this entire presentation is spoilers. Um, the whole thing is spoilers. If you care about La Mulana 1 and you feel like learning spoilers about it uh, would hurt your enjoyment of the game, then this probably isn't for you. This will end up going on YouTube, so you can definitely watch it later. Um, chat, I'm not going to police whether or not people in chat want to talk about La Mulana 2, but do keep in mind that we are trying to stay pretty focused on La Mulana 1 here. And I will mention one more thing, is that I will almost exclusively uh, be avoiding discussing La Mulana 2, except for at the very end, I will mention a few very small plot details from La Mulana 2, um, but they're ones that are told by La Mulana 1. So basically, I'm using La Mulana 2 to confirm what I'm saying. Um, that's it. That's all I'm saying. Um, everything that I'm going to talk about in this presentation is backed by the text. Um, so this is almost all exclusively pulled from the lore dump. Um, I will tell you when we transition into speculation or deductive reasoning, um, there will be a few times where I'm going to probably be reaching a little bit um, with what my theories are about certain things. And I'll try to be very clear about times where uh, that is just speculation. So I'll try to be really clear about the times where what I'm saying is not backed by the text. And so with that, let's jump in. So why do we care about the lore? So that's our number one question is why do we care about the lore? Uh, ultimately... Understanding the lore in La Mulana is extremely important to solving its puzzles. Um, the puzzles in La Mulana, if you've never played it, um, are very much based around kind of understanding a story and understanding the part you play in that story. And so you do have to understand the lore to a certain extent to be able to solve the puzzles at all. But do we have to understand the lore fully in order to be able to play La Mulana? Well, the answer is no. I mean, I didn't know... 90% of this stuff when I played it initially and I was still able to complete the game. Um, so, for that reason, it kind of, it's worth going back and inspecting all of the text in a second pass once you're not focusing on just solving puzzles and banging out gameplay. When you could actually look at it objectively and figure out how it all pieces together, um, I think it is worthwhile to look at the lore and figure out how it all fits together. So we're going to try our best to understand the lore fully. Um, my goal is to get as close as possible through this discussion. Um, we'll see if that's actually possible. So, the Cliff's Notes version. Um, if, if this is all you're here for, is to find out what La Mulana is about. Here's what La Mulana is about. Uh, Mom came to Earth. She doesn't want to be on Earth. That's the wrong place for her. Um, but she can't go back to heaven. Um, and so she creates children, like a ton of children, like a lot, a lot of children. The entire Earth, all of humanity, every creature on the planet is essentially born from the mother crash landing on Earth. 
Uh, and they were all born for the purpose of fulfilling this wish. That's, that's why she did it. Um, ultimately, her children are a massive disappointment. And so she threatens to destroy all of humanity. Um, and the people who are aware that the mom is threatening to destroy humanity don't like that much. Uh, so they figure out basically that the only remaining option is to kill the mother. That That is the uh, whole of the lore. And if this is all you walk away from this with, uh, understanding at a high level, um, then you actually understand a lot of La Mulana. Um, this discussion will get in the weeds on a lot of different topics. I, I did my best to try to not get into the weeds, but it will get into the weeds on a lot of different topics. Um, but ultimately, this is the high-level synopsis. If you understand this, you understand what you need to know. So let's talk about how La Mulana is built. So um, one of the big twists that you learn about halfway through the game is that the ruins of La Mulana themselves are the body of the mother. It is not that the mother's soul is inside the ruins that we're finding. It is that the ruins themselves are La Mulana. So the ruins themselves are the mother. Um, La Mulana is divided into a ton of regions that we refer to as fields. This is just the term that I think the translation uses, and so that's what I'm going to use it to refer to. Uh, if you hear me say fields, I'm talking about the different zones inside La Mulana. Uh, each of these fields actually do have a numbering, so um, I'm not going to get uh, I'm not going to get into the exceptions to this rule. But for the most part, every field has a number. Um, and they're connected to one another by ladders. So if you want to get from one zone to another, you either walk through a doorway, you go up or down a ladder, whatever the case may be. Um, each of the primary fields has a front and a back side. So as far as we're concerned, we'll, we'll call those... I mean, they're not the same field, but they're, they're intrinsically related through that mechanism. Each field is exactly 20 screens in size. Um, so a screen meaning the amount of screen real estate you have each field is exactly 20 screens in size And that feels like that's getting into the weeds a little bit But ultimately it actually ends up playing a pretty significant role in understanding the lore as well um, but the important thing here is that each of those 20 fields can actually be folded into a 4x5 tessellation. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that in just a moment. But the idea is, is that each of these fields, if you were to kind of fold it on itself in just the right way, it would, it would actually fit perfectly into a 4x5 rectangle. Um, now, you have to understand this relatively early on in the game in order to solve a few puzzles. Um, but this will actually have um, some specific implications as well as we go forward. Um, the exceptions to that rule just aren't terribly important. Um, and uh, last, I guess, point of order for the architecture of La Milana is that each of the primary fields has a guardian that protects a wedge that plays a role in kind of the overarching task of trying to seal away the mother's spirit. So if, the, if you consider the goal of the game to be to investigate the ruins, to solve the mystery, to find mom and to kill her, um, then uh, the, each of the fields has a guardian um, that is protecting the wedge that plays that role inside the, the game. Um, yeah, by the way, this is going to be super informal, so if people talk about something interesting in chat, I will absolutely go on a tangent about it. Yeah, the manual definitely explains the 4x5 thing. So the, the manual, um, it, it, it doesn't, um, the manual doesn't, like, show it to you so cleanly, but it implies it in just the right way that you can learn it pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, anyway, um, what's a tessellation? Uh, so a tessellation is the way that you can take geometric shapes to cover a surface such that there's no overlap and there's no gaps. Um, so the example I would give is this right here. You can see the picture of the Tower of the Goddess as it's laid out in the game on the left. But if you were to take some of those pieces and kind of like, if you take the whole bottom half, right, rows six, seven, eight, and nine, cut them off and paste them up above, you can see it just like fits in perfectly. Um, likewise, if you take that column E tile and you and you cut it off and paste it over on the other side, like it ends up fitting together uh, perfectly well. Um, it, it's uh, it's. 
And this works for all the fields. So every field, even ones that kind of have like a weird shaping to them, they all fit this model right here, which is, which is, I think, really important. Uh, if you understand that, that will take you a long way to understanding a lot of details in, in Llama Llama. Okay. So, uh, just so that I've kind of, um, covered the remainder of my terminology just so that I, I make sure that when I mention a location you know it's a location because maybe you've never heard of it before uh, this is the list of all the front side and back side fields in La Milana I know there's fields in here I haven't mentioned I'm satisfied not mentioning them at the moment uh, the list of the front side fields are the Gate of Guidance, Mausoleum of the Giants, Temple of the Sun, Spring in the Sky, Inferno Caverns, Chamber of Extinction, Twin Labyrinths, and Endless Corridor in that order that's the numbering and then on the right side, we have, uh, in the backside fields, we have Gate of Illusion, Graveyard of the Giants, Temple of Moonlight, Tower of the Goddess, Tower of Ruin, Chamber of Birth, Twin Labyrinths, and Dimensional Corridor. And the ones that share a number from the left and the right columns also share an implicit uh, relationship because there are frontside, backside doors that take you between them. So if you go through a backside door in Inferno Caverns, for instance, you'll go to Tower of Ruin. And there are exceptions to this rule in some very specific cases that ultimately do not matter. Um, but for the most part, this is this is the, the architecture of La Mulana as it stands. Yeah, Shrine of the Mother has the number 9, but then you get into an argument about whether or not Shrine of the Mother in the front side field and True Shrine of the Mother in the back side field, and it just gets messy. So for what it's worth, I'm content leaving at this right now. Um, you could call the surface... Um, field zero if you wanted to. I think that that's not a particularly useful uh, thing either. Just in general, this kind of helps you understand the, the broad architecture. Uh, you don't have to have memorized any of these numbers. You don't have to figure out exactly how they map up in order for all of what I'm going to say to make sense. I will, I will shout out numbers as I go if I need to. Um, but for the most part, if you understand this... Um, then you, you, you have a good handle on what we're doing. Alright. So, first mystery uh, that we intend to solve is where is La Mulana located? Um, this question's come up a few times, and this is one where uh, there's a lot of speculation in play. Um, when you enter the game, you get this map. Um, you see La Mesa running on the map to get to La Mulana. And we have a few uh, spots on it that we can note. So um, we have Bonga Wonga um, is the location on the left, if you can't see it very well. On the bottom, there's Eglana. At the top, there's Tower of Oannes. And on the right, there's La Mulana. And these, uh, these positions on the map um, can kind of give us some clues about what we're essentially looking for. Um, so, for instance, the tower of the map, uh, sorry, the, the map includes uh, the Tower of Oannes. So if you're not familiar with who Oannes is, Oannes was a Babylonian fish god who shared wisdom on the bank of the Persian Gulf. Um, as, the, as the mythology goes, he, he would sort of uh, jump out of the, out of the sea um, every morning. Um, it's unclear whether or not he was a fish man or whether or not he was a man in a fish suit. It's, uh, I don't, I don't know whether or not that is necessarily relevant here, but it, it, we, we will refer to him as a fish god. Um, but he was Babylonian. Um, so, so from that region of the world, um, the map includes two prominent branching rivers. I'm not necessarily saying it's the Tigris and Euphrates, but, um, as we'll see as we go through, there's a lot of theming around the Tigris and the Euphrates in La Mulana. So uh, I'm, I'm willing to say sure, maybe. And also the giant waterfall that's on the right-hand side of the map, if you go there on the surface and look at your map, the name of that screen is called Bahrun's Waterfall. That could be a reference to Bahrain. Um, and so for that reason, I think I'm comfortable saying that um, La Mulana probably lands in somewhere around Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, and Persian Gulf. Um, the game is not super clear about where it's located, but if that, uh, if that helps you, then yeah, that whole sort of cradle of civilization notion uh, that's so, so common uh, almost certainly is being played out here in La Mulana.
Uh, yeah, so we'll talk more about that. Well, I promise. I won't. I, I will leave almost no stone unturned if I can help it. So, yeah, we'll definitely get to that. Um, the breakdown that I'm going to go through here... Um, yeah, that's, that's probably true. Yeah, I, I didn't think about sort of examining the um the terrain I, I guess being heavily wooded would would maybe say that it's possible that it's somewhere else but yeah i mean ultimately it could just be a fictional location we draw on enough themes that it's kind of fun to speculate whether or not it's a real world location but um at the end of the day the truth of the matter is uh going to be that it just doesn't matter um so, uh, the breakdown that we're going to go through here, as best as possible, is I'm going to focus on a civilization or a, a generation at a time. So, we're, um, the mother had multiple generations of children. Um, you know, the first children, the second children, the third children. Um, that is heavily described and interrogated in the in the lore, um, and that's going to be the same structure I'm going to use. So, uh, first up, we need to talk about the first children. Um, so. Who were the first children? Uh, they had snake-like bodies. They worshipped the mother as a god. Um, but ultimately, either they didn't understand the mother's wishes, or they just frankly didn't care. Um, they imitated the mother's power, but it was imperfectly. So they had the power to create life just like the mother did. But for one reason or another, at least the lore describes it as being um, an imperfect imitation of her power. Um, they created their own children. Um, Nua, at least uh, in 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 uh, Chinese folklore, uh, creates children. We'll we'll talk about um, Nua at length in just a moment. Um, but but basically, the the running theme for the first children is that they had the same power the mother had, but they didn't wield it properly. So. Um, them creating children was not the birth of the second children. They just had their own children. So the first children had children of their own, and, and they were considered to all fall under the category of the first children. So one question you might ask yourself is, why, um, why is there so much... Why are there so many snakes in in the first children? Like, why is the theme of the first children snakes? And it actually um, aligns really well with... Um, actual creation myth. So everything, almost so many different civilizations, I, I won't say broadly, but so many civilizations have their own creation myths that center around snakes and kind of utilize them in the same way. Um, it's kind of like the carcinization of the mythology world, right? On a long enough timeline, everything just becomes snakes. Um, Snakes in mythology often represent wisdom. Wisdom, because of their unblinking eyes, is, is usually the reason that's given. Uh, immortality. Um, snakes are seen from a mythological perspective as immortal because they can just, like, shed their skin, which is kind of seen as a way of, like, regaining youth. Um, and are often associated with creation myths. Um, so, uh, some examples of that are... Um, in Greek mythology, the great snake Orpheon uh, incubated the primordial egg that gave birth to all of creation. So this this is um, sort of an older fo folkloric tradition than just you know the Titans and the and the uh, Olympians and and all of that. This is an older Greek tradition of the great snake Orpheon uh, kind of birthing all of creation uh, from a a uh, an egg before time. Um, Aboriginal peoples of, uh, I believe specifically Australia, have a, have a number of creation myths that uh, involve this great rainbow serpent. Um, there's the Asura serpent Vritra in ancient Indian myth, um, who, while, they, while Vritra was not known for um, necessarily like birthing creation, um, it kind of aligns here because Vritra in, in folklore swallowed the primordial ocean so just you know <laughs> drank all of the water of the ocean and uh you could sort of visualize it as birthing all of creation when indra uh the lightning god uh split his belly with a thunderbolt 
Um, so it's kind of unsurprising that for a generation that was focused on uh, creation and making children and, and that being their claim to fame, uh, focusing on making them snakes is kind of unsurprising. Um, so let's talk about a few of the prominent ones that we see in La Milana 1. So the first one is Nuwa. Uh, Nuwa um, is the mother goddess from Chinese folklore, Merita uh, Fushi. Um, and is the as the story goes, uh, there are a number of stories centering around Nuwa. She, um, she uh, restored the pillars of heaven um, when they were destroyed in a great battle. Um, and she used like these rainbow stones to repair the the pillars of heaven. But outside of that, um, one of the stories that's associated with Nuwa is in her boredom, she created all of humanity from clay. So she took her time and and carefully and meticulously created these little human figures from the clay. And then, after realizing um, that this was going to take too long after realizing that this was a tedious process uh she th as the story goes she kind of just took a string and just dragged it across all of the the mud and kind of just like whatever popped up that was that was creation and um chinese folklore kind of uses that to explain the difference between nobility who are like personally handcrafted from the beautiful yellow clay by nua's own hands to the common people uh, who were just kind of, you know, we dragged a string through the mud. <laughs> like, it's... Uh, enjoy. Um, enjoy that story. Um, so, typically, Nua and Fushi are, are depicted with a square and compass, and there's actually kind of a lot to that story, um, why they're depicted that way. Um, so, uh, the... I'm trying to remember what, what it's called. The square that is held by um by nua is called a tri-square um it's like a, a more primitive um tool that's used in woodworking um and then uh fushi is often depicted with a compass um and you can kind of dive deeper into this to understand like what's what's interesting about this it, it kind of goes fairly deep and i'm not sure how much in the weeds I want to go. The short version of it is that Nua and Fushi are supposed to kind of represent this yin and yang um, perspective where the square is seen as sort of a masculine tool and the compass is seen as sort of because it because it, it's associated with um, sort of more thinking and cerebral activity is seen as a woman's tool. And yet Nua is depicted holding the square while Fushi is depicted as holding the compass, and it's supposed to be like this, this, uh, this juxtaposition of like uh, femininity against masculinity in a way that's not exactly. Uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm being clumsy with my explanation of this. Um, it, ultimately, it's supposed to be this juxtaposition of the woman holding the masculine tool and the man holding the feminine tool, and it's kind of just. Um, there, there's a lot of depth to ultimately um, what what that story is meant to explain. So let's talk about Tiamat as well. So Tiamat is the Mesopotamian creator goddess and primordial goddess of the sea. Um, Tiamat is considered to be the goddess of the... Um, let me make sure I'm getting this right. I'm pretty sure Tiamat is meant to be the goddess of fresh water, and her husband Abzu is supposed to be the um, the god of salt water. And the idea is is that their union is the meeting of fresh water and salt water in the Persian Gulf. I, I may have it backwards, um, but yeah, okay, I had it backwards then. Um, but the idea is is that like the mixing of those waters is kind of the union of Tiamat and Apsu. Um, Tiamat is often depicted as a serpent or a dragon, but I think that um, people who <laughs> kind of work in this space in in uh, in I don't know archaeology would probably debate that point. I, I don't think that the actual stories of um, Tiamat 
directly imply that she is a sea serpent or a dragon. It's just often the way that she's depicted. Um, she gave birth to a number of children with Absu. Uh, they begat many lesser gods. Um, and what ended up happening was Absu started being worried that he was going to be challenged, that his lordship was going to be challenged. And I think it was him that struck the first blow, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So he sort of like uh, pushed back, assuming that they were going to challenge him for his lordship. Um, and ultimately, whether he was right or wrong, they did, and they killed him. Um, so good to be on the winning team, I guess. Um, in the process, though, um, you know, Tiamat ended up kind of taking sides with Abzu. Um, she stood with Abzu against her children, who were, I mean... I don't know, mutiny, whatever, uh, uh, regicide of some sort. Um, ultimately, Tiamat ends up giving birth to uh, a, a additional set of children, these dragons. Um, and as the story goes, she filled their bodies with venom rather than blood. Um, in the end, all, all of this is, is more or less kind of just... Um, me, me spinning my wheels on Tiamat, but in the end she was slain by Marduk, um, who uh, ended up in killing her, forming the heavens and earth with her divided body. Um, so, so Marduk killed Tiamat and then used her various body parts to create the world that we know. Um, we'll, we'll get back to Tiamat. Um, it's impossible to talk about Lamalana for more than 10 minutes at a time without saying Tiamat's name. Uh, so, expect to hear Tiamat's name a thousand more times. So, uh, let's talk about Tiamat specifically um, in La Moana. So, Tiamat created the Dimensional Corridor. Um, that is textually backed, that Tiamat created the Dimensional Corridor. And in the in the context of La Moana, even sealed away in an Ankh um, has an immense amount of power. Just absolutely immense amount of power. Um, she is capable of disrupting the power of the Holy Grail. She's capable of swapping the Dimensional Corridor with the Endless Corridor, um, which is unbelievable that she can just kind of move things around however we want to. Um, and then at the end, uh, even with all of that, it takes several it takes several items to be able to uh, from here even make it into the dimensional corridor. So once we know where it went, um, it takes it takes multiple items to get into the dimensional corridor, to be able to kill her children. Um, she is really, really powerful, I, I think is the big takeaway here. The, the thing that you're supposed to understand is that Tiamat is like second to only the mother in her strength in the ruins. Um, whether or not we will hold to that opinion by the end of this uh, remains to be seen. But ultimately what we're supposed to take from this is that she wields a reckless amount of power. Um, we need the Crystal Skull to enter the Dimensional Corridor, and even once we're in here, her children are immortal. I mean, the whole reason why she created the, dim the Dimensional Corridor was in a bid to grant her children immortality. That's why she created it. And... Um, it takes even more tools to be able to uh, to be able to take down her children. So eventually, uh, the first children move on, and, and we we're going to have to move on to talking about the second children. Um, in order to talk about the second children, though, uh, we need to talk about what happened upon the aftermath of the first children. And if you're going to be really specific here, if you're going to be really really uh, careful about what text we use here. A lot of this isn't backed by Lamalana in the game. It is backed by some of Naramura's writings afterward. Um, but ultimately, if we just accept this for what it is, um, the first children, by some power, learn magic that was able to separate their bodies from their tails. Um, and that's actually how the Guardian Amphisbina was supposedly born was that uh, all of these 
first children had shed their tails and these tails um, merged together and evolved in different ways and ultimately became um, you know, the guardian that we're aware of. Uh, Pliny the Elder is where at least the most notable lore of the Amphis being a creature. Um, and so the description of Amphis being a, is a twin head that it one that is one at its tail end as well as though it were not enough poison to be poured out of one mouth. I just thought that was kind of an interesting description of Amphispina. Um, and ultimately, all of the snakes in the ruins are meant to be evolved from this initial offspring. So the asps, the axe head snakes, uh, the nozuchi, the nagas, all of these are meant to be um, sort of evolutions of the, the quote-unquote offspring, and when I say offspring, know that what I'm talking about is they shed their tails, and these tails ultimately evolved. Whatever that means, hard to say exactly what that means, but um, their, their tails became monsters. That's cool. <laughs> good, good for them. Uh, I, I hope as much success for the rest of us in our lives. So let's move on to the second children. So, so here's our here's our boy, here's our boy Sakit. Um, so the second children, uh, they were giants, and they were very good at building things. I don't know exactly why those two ideas are like tied together, but um, according to uh, Mulbrook, um, they are giants and therefore are good at building things. And as a six foot six guy, I'll tell you that being tall has not made me any better at assembling anything. Um, but okay, sure. They were responsible for building many of the fields throughout the ruins. They're specifically credited for a great many fields. Um, they did have the knowledge to return the mother to the skies um, and actually attempted to do so. This is um, probably one of the best documented generations in all of the ruins. So they had the knowledge, they knew what they needed to do, and they actually were willing to undertake the task. Uh, that is an uncommon thing that we'll see throughout the generations is both possessing the knowledge and having the interest in doing it. Could the first children have sent the mother back to the heavens? I don't know, but they didn't want to, and they didn't really care. It's not so much like they were interested in doing the opposite. It's that they were not interested in doing what they were asked to do. Um, and later, later, uh, later children may have been willing to do so, but just didn't have the means to accomplish it. Um, so the second children attempted to build a flying machine to fulfill her wishes. I feel like attempting, like writing the word attempted right there is kind of uh, giving up the game, but we'll, we'll, we'll make uh, more sense of it. And also worth noting is that the second children were responsible for destroying the first children. Um, so specifically Mulbrook says that the end of the first children came about when the first children destroyed them. Um, so... I don't know, they got a violent streak too, I guess. Ultimately, some did survive, though, and we'll see what that looks like as it um, as we go through the remainder of the children. Um, there were some first children who survived uh, this absolute destruction, I guess. The most famous story, um, I think sometimes people misunderstand uh, thinking that I think sometimes people misunderstand thinking that because we hear so much about the story of the Nine Brothers that there were nine giants, and there weren't. There were actually tons of giants, um, but the leaders of the giants were this group of nine brothers. So the brothers were Zebu, Bado, Majella, Leto, Fudo, Abuto, G, Ribu, and Sakit. And as the story goes, uh, Bado, uh, Majella, Leto, and Fudo all wanted to build a flying tower to return the mother to the skies. So um, this is actually where a lot of the fields in the ruins came from. Uh, they built the Tower of the Goddess. This was what the flying machine was supposed to be. Um, there was the spring in the sky. That was supposed to be the reservoir of water that was going to power the machine. It was a machine powered by water. Uh, there was the Inferno Cavern that was going to heat the water to power the machine. There's the Tower of Ruin, which is the only one that's not specifically mentioned what its purpose was in this whole ordeal. Uh, it is mentioned as being built by the giants for this purpose, but it never says, like, the Tower of Ruin was meant for X. 
But ultimately, we can imagine with all of the pumps and the machinery that's in there with, uh, with magma, that it ultimately was probably meant to move the magma around. Tower of Ruin happens to be the backside of Inferno Cavern anyway, so you might imagine that it was moving lava back and forth between Tower of Ruin to keep it heated. Um, and then finally, the Graveyard of the Giants was built to cool the machine back down. So even though the water had to get hot in order to fly the machine, the machine itself, they didn't want it to be hot. Um, and so it was built to cool the machine back down. You may notice, um, by the way, I will talk about it more later, um, but I, I just want to point out here that you may notice that um, the, the names on this list of all the fields, Mausoleum of the Giants is not here. Um, so the Mausoleum of the Giants was not actually built by the Giants. That's kind of, I don't know, interesting to me. If you weren't aware of that, here you go. Um, so, so, sort of to follow the story on, Abuto, G, Ribu, and Sakit um, didn't want to build this machine. They had hoped that the mother would stay with them and remain in this land. You know, they didn't want to be abandoned by their mother. They didn't want to be left behind. They wanted her to feel comfortable and stay behind. That was the idea. And this tension ended up leading to a civil war when Sakit, uh, killed Leto. Um, the text specifically mentions a gaping hole in his chest. You can see it right there on the statue as there's a giant hole in, in the chest of one of the statues. That is supposed to be Leto. Um... Now, you'll notice that Zebu wasn't mentioned on either side. Zebu did not take a side. He was responsible for whatever sustain the land means. Um, in the context of Mausoleum of the Giants, it's easy to get caught up with the idea of the Zebu statue actually holding up one of the platforms. But you got to remember, that was not built by the second children. That is not actually Zebu. That is a statue. Um, and so it's not necessarily obvious what sustain the land actually means, but what we know is that Zebu did not take part in the actual, um, either building the flying tower or resisting the building of the flying tower. He did not take part in the civil war. A few other bits of, um, sort of text thrown around that, um, helps us understand the story better. Uh, Mygella carried a lake to this land and then drew his last breath. Um, ultimately, that probably means that Mygella was responsible for bringing the water to the spring in the sky before dying. Um, and then Rebu dug a hole to send the lake's water to the tower. Um, that specifically, if you've played La Mulana, is the puzzle where you have to know that you can go down that pipe in order to make the transition from uh, Mausoleum of the Giants to Spring in the Sky. Uh, again, I do feel like I have to point out that... Mausoleum of the Giants was not created by the second children, and therefore that probably wasn't actually the hole that sent the lake's water to the tower. While while that pipe that we're pointing at is an homage, it almost certainly is not actually the hole that was dug to send the lake's water to the tower. Um, this ends up representing the connection between Spring in the Sky and Tower of the Goddess. So the pipe is not the thing that's interesting here. It's the connection between Spring in the Sky and the Tower of the Goddess. Um, in the end, uh, I'm going to I'm going to fast forward a little bit, mostly because there's not a lot of information in the in between. But I'm going to fast forward and get to the point where I say the Giants ultimately failed to achieve their goals. We know that the Giants ultimately failed to achieve their goals. How do we know? Mom didn't leave Earth. Okay, uh, there you go. Uh, that's how we know. Um, if you did uh, follow along well with the lore, you may remember a specific tablet that says uh, Mu. I'm going to pronounce it Mu. Uh, you can pronounce it Mu if you want to. I don't really care. Uh, it, it says Mu is the nameless one, the one who rises into the sky. Um, and so you might be inclined... This, by the way, in the bottom right here is the etching of um this is the etching that's on that tablet so we see this picture of what uh, i'm i'm going to interpret it and say it looks like a rocket pointing at the sun so i think that you're meant to read it um as you know this is the flying machine surely this is the name of the flying machine uh that was leading to heaven right this is the name of the flying machine that the giants were building um and so the question is is mu uh the tower of the goddess and I think, hopefully you'll agree with me, um, that the answer ultimately is no, probably not. Uh, first off, the flying tower failed. 
Um, so it's definitely not the one who rises into the sky. That sure would suck if the one who rises into the sky didn't. Um, and second, as someone pointed out, um, a really, really interesting detail here is that the Japanese word, mu, um, essentially means non-existence. Um, so it translates to sort of a broadly negative term. Um, and so I think the way that you can interpret this is that the one that rises into the sky doesn't exist. Mu is the nameless one, the one who rises into the sky. Nothing rises into the sky. Mu means nothing. It's, uh, it's kind of... It's just, it's just, yeah, it, it comes from a, a tradition in, in uh, Zen Buddhism. I, I'm not personally super authoritative on this topic. A lot of what you're seeing here on this slide was cribbed from discussions that happened in my Discord, including uh, Worse's translation of a few specific um, glyphs and uh, Japanese symbols. Uh, to help me understand it better as a non-Japanese speaker. Uh, but I think what I understand it, how I understand it, is that this interpretation is actually reinforced by the Lamalani's script. So um, in Japanese, Lamalani, so if you don't know, by the way, in Lamalana, uh, all of the tablets are written in a Lamalani's language that you need a glyph reader to translate. And um, the glyph reader is really just doing a substitution cipher. Turns out everyone spoke English. Great for them. Um, so it's kind of uninteresting in English. But in Japanese Lamulanese, each symbol um, actually corresponds to a broader idea. Like the concept of Lamulanese works better from a lore perspective in Japanese. And these symbols are the ones that are used, these two symbols you see on the left are the ones that are used in the ancient Lamalani script before the translation occurs. And these glyphs correspond to the words name and to mu, or occasionally nothing. And then the bottom one, the second one, translates to answer and promise. And the only change between these glyphs in ancient Lamalani's is the addition of the ideograph for up. So the idea that you, uh, you know, it, adding up to that idea um, is all it takes to translate from one word to the other. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, you can actually get really... This slide deck would be like 10 times longer if I really tried to go through ancient Japanese... Or, sorry, ancient Lamulanese on the Japanese script. Because I feel like there are so many just fascinating ways that it, it combines them together. Um... Anyway, that is my interpretation of this. A few people in chat have said uh, that because Mu translates to the, um, the, the concept of unasking the question, um, that, that it may ultimately just refer to not being the right question. I think that's a great interpretation. And, and honestly, this is one of the areas where um, I'm using a lot of speculative reasoning. And I think my interpretation makes sense, but I totally believe that there's a ton of other possible interpretations uh, of this. So if you like another way of thinking about this, um, please, by all means, um, you know, let me know what your cool idea is about this this concept. But um, I think I think Mu turned out to be one of the more interesting mysteries that I I started investigating. For the purpose of doing this, um, once I kind of got hooked on it, I realized that there was really just so much here. There's just a ton of really, really great information. So, now that we've uh, talked about the second children, we'll come back to more about the second children. Um, I mean, we'll never, we'll, ne we'll never leave any of this. Um, it's... Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to talking about Mu and the second children. We never get away from any of this. Let's start talking about the third children. So, uh, you know, after the second children, we moved on to the third children. Uh, the third children were winged flying creatures who ultimately, for the most part, dwelled in the twin labyrinths. So their home was the twin labyrinths. Um, as far as their relationship to the second children, they actually chased the second children away during their civil war. Maybe... Um, Maybe they really hated the idea of war, uh, which we'll find out is definitely not the reason. 
Um, but they chased them away. They were causing too much trouble and they got rid of them. Um, there's actually a lot of different um, backgrounds that the third children draw from. So there's the obvious um, Greek Roman mythology that's being drawn from for the third children. Uh, you, we see Hermes, we see Neptune. Um, there's also a lot of Abrahamic religion. So there's a lot of talk of angels and demons. Uh, there's uh, Baphomet appears here in the Twin Labyrinths. There's a lot that's drawn from that. Um, there's the, the witches, which for better or for worse are associated with, um, with I guess, le let me be more specific in that case, Christianity. Um, the architectural theme in Twin Labyrinths is Atlantis, which I think is interesting because I missed out on that when I originally played the game, but Naramura says that specifically the theme of Twin Labyrinths was Atlantis, which actually intersects with the lore in, um, in the Twin Labyrinths really, really interestingly. Um, so... Mulbrook says they created a country somewhere on the surface, but most of it was flooded by the mother in her wrath sinking beneath the sea. And so I was first drawn to seeing that as the great flood in, in the Bible, um, the Christian Bible. Um, but, uh, Nora Murrow was actually drawing on Atlantis here. So the idea of the lost city of Atlantis, which eventually sunk beneath, beneath the sea, uh, supposedly due to earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Um, uh, Mulbrook also mentions that they had spread to the surface, which is kind of interesting. This is the first race that is specifically mentioned of um, spreading to the surface, um, and they split into factions of demons and angels and started a war. Also super important and feels like it uh, is pulling directly from Abrahamic myth. Um that is a really weird thing to say, Abrahamic myth. I don't think it's fair. Hey, let me let me take one brief aside to say, I think it's kind of shitty that sometimes we... Um, I, I promised myself I wouldn't swear during, during this. I think it kind of sucks that sometimes we talk about other people's religions as mythology and folklore, and we talk about our own religion as being this sacrosanct thing. Um, so I don't feel bad about saying Abrahamic folklore. Uh, I, just, I just don't think it's... I just don't think it's appropriate. Anyway, uh, I'll get back to being on topic again, probably. Um, in the end, they caused an eruption in the ruins and were destroyed all at once. Um, so, so we know how the third civilization um, ended. We know that they were destroyed all at once by supposedly an eruption. And I don't have a picture of it. It's actually really, it was really hard for me to get a picture of it. I tried several times. But if you look in the background of Twin Labyrinths, you can actually see volcanoes in the background. Um, it, it very clearly has sort of like a 3D spatial reasoning, uh, 3D spatial aspect to it. And you can see the, um, you can see the volcanoes in the background. Um, so let's talk about the twin labyrinths. It builds on the mythologies. It, it builds on multiple mythologies about the twins. So first, how does it intersect in La Mulana? Well, um, in La Mulana, we learn about the story of the hero of the third children, Hermes, and pretty much, really, really consistently throughout the text, the hero of the third children is always referring to Hermes. In fact, there's only like two instances in the entire text where they use hero for anything else. And both of those times are like Zelpid talking to you and calling you a hero. Um, every other time that hero is mentioned, they're talking about Hermes specifically. Um, the description for the boots, by the way, say that they're a treasure of a uh, hero of the third children. Um, and, and Hermes is just broadly talked about as a hero. Um, and he ended up capturing Edigna and Buranun. I've never had to say those names out loud before, and I'm just now realizing that that sucks. Um, if you're not familiar with those names, those are uh, names... For uh, or those names correspond to alternative names for the Tigris and the Euphrates. I said that I was going to come back to the Tigris and the Euphrates. Edigna is, um, I don't know, Sumerian, ancient Sumerian name for the Tigris, and Buranun is the ancient Sumerian name for the Euphrates. Um, and so the twin rivers are the twins. Um, they actually survived uh, the second children. They lived past that, obviously, because they were captured by Hermes. Um, it, the text specifically says that Edigna and Buranun were the last remaining survivors of the first children. And um, 
This is not from the text, but it's actually really interesting that um, specifically Marduk killing Tiamat in in uh, in mythology. It's said that her weeping eyes form the Tigris and the Euphrates. So in that way, even that mythology unmentioned is brought into La Mulana um, to form sort of the birth of Digna and Burnan. In that way, we can kind of see them as being Tiamat's children. Um, yeah, we talked about that a little bit on Discord. I guess that's actually kind of an interesting thing to say. Um, the The description of the statue, if you scan it, says that it's the uh, depicting Hermes rescuing or saving uh, the the twin children. Though other tablets elsewhere um, specifically say that he captured them. Um, I think the solution to that contradiction that we came up with ultimately we should all feel welcome to kind of just accept contradictions as being a natural side effect of, of writing complicated mythology. But if we, if we really feel strongly about figuring out some sort of, uh, I don't know, orthodoxical single reading of the text, what, what you could say is that the, um, hand scanner, whatever it's reading from um, the seventh children, because the seventh children were s responsible for a lot of that information, uh, may have just been misunder or misunderstanding what they were seeing. It could just be the case that they looked at this statue, this is actually the statue depicted here, and just thought it looks like he's saving them, um, when in reality they are interpreting the statue incorrectly. I don't know if that's right. It's just, it's kind of an interesting way of thinking about it. Uh, the other statues of Adigna and Burnan in um, the Twin Labyrinths have a really prominent three marking on them, which is almost certainly an indication of sort of like ownership, uh, because the um, because Adigna and Burnan were were kidnapped, were held captive by the third children. They were kind of branded by the third children, if that's how you want to think about it. Whatever the case may be, um, that's that's what we see in the ruins. Going back to um, Atlantis, by the way, in Plato's telling of the story of Atlantis, Poseidon actually sired five pairs of male twins. Um, so the story of Atlantis is like built on the backs of twins. Poseidon sired five pairs of male twins. If you're not uh, keen on math, that's ten children. Uh, the eldest of which was Atlas, who was made king of the island in the ocean, and all of the other brothers were given sort of their own rule, either a portion of the island and some number of, of people to rule over. Um, but it's kind of interesting that, um, at least according to Naramura, it was unintentional, but it's kind of interesting that uh, the twin labyrinths being themed after Atlantis also have an additional tie to Atlantis through that twin theming. So it's, I think it's just kind of interesting. Um, we do see Neptune throughout uh, Poseidon, throughout the uh, twin labyrinths in a few statues. Um, he comes up in some tablets. He comes up in some explanations of various things. Um, so, so it's obvious that there is a joining of sort of that Greek and Roman mythology with Atlantis, with, uh, I think, plenty of things I pointed out that, that make it obvious that there's also kind of a, an Abrahamic, you know, story of the Great Flood, story of angels and demons that are coming through here as well. So, uh, you know, there's kind of, there's kind of a lot. There's just a lot. Um, as far as the third children specifically go in the ruins, uh, Naramura has confirmed, uh, Naramura specifically stated that pretty much any winged creature carving sub boss is, is almost certainly a third child, right? So like we can ignore like the bats because they probably don't count. Uh, I don't know. Maybe the bats count. I don't know. But, um, just in general, any, any prominent creature or carving or sub boss or anything that is winged is probably third children. So we have Baphomet, we have the Sirens, we have Zu, also known as Anzu, we have Periton, Pazuzu, Beelzebub. Uh, if, if it's got wings, boy howdy, is it a third child? Um, there's even examples of skeletons, uh, like human looking skeletons with, with splayed out wings like skeletal wings, bone wings, in the background of Shrine of the Mother, um, kind of looking like uh, they died there, being kind of hung up, strung up, and um, and decomposed. So uh, we do see third children even as far as the Shrine of the Mother. Um, 
where do the witches come in? So the witches, uh, we'll talk about them a little bit later, um, but the witches are more meant to be supportive of the, I think, the Abrahamic references here, um, since Baphomet sort of lorded over the witches' Sabbath. Um, I don't necessarily think that them riding brooms indicates clearly that they're meant to be third children. I, if you told me that you believe them to be third children, I'd give you a thumbs up and a smile. I, I don't I don't feel strongly about trying to place them. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, that's that's mostly how I see it. All right, uh, we're going to move past the third children. There's actually, what we'll find as we go on through more and more children, um, we have to reach a little more and more to talk about the lore of those children because um, the game doesn't support it as much. It goes very in-depth on what happened with the first children. It goes extremely in-depth. Holy goodness, it goes in-depth on the second children. And then it just kind of tapers off uh, for a lot of it. You can definitely tell that some of the children existed only to serve as sort of a, a patchwork quilt to get all the way from the first children to the eighth children. Um, but we're going to we're gonna kind of explore what there is to see in each of them. So. so let's talk about the fourth children. So uh, what are the fourth children? Um, they had bodies of fish, but they ultimately lacked the ability to fly. Um, I think... I don't know if it's necessarily intentional or whether or not it just kind of random happenstance, but it does kind of follow logically that the four children would be fish fishes, fishies, fishers, fish, um, considering the third children were wiped out by a flood, that there was a flood. Um, so uh, it, it, it lines up sort of in a chronological sense, I think, nicely, but... Um, Yeah, we're, we're not talking anything La Milana 2, so the way that La Milana 2 delves into um, the fourth children uh, will be skipped over. They inherited the civilizations of the past. Um, I think the main thing to take away from that reading when it says inherited the civilizations of the past, I think the important thing to take away from that is that um, they didn't build their own fields. In fact, I, I think the game largely is trying to get you to interpret them as being unintelligent. They're just kind of, um, they, they don't have, Mulbrook says that they, they lost their purpose. Uh, they passed on their knowledge to the fifth children and just kind of faded out ultimately. Um, they inherited uh, civilizations of the past, so while they primarily lived in the spring in the sky, they didn't build spring in the sky. They just, I don't know, they're just there. It's a convenient place for them because there's a lot of water. Yeah, it, it's not until this picture was blown up that I ever noticed all of the, like, Lameza holes on the floor. Um, just, like, crunched into the floor. Uh, I just never noticed it because I'd always looked at that image so much smaller and didn't pay attention to it. I just think it's a really great, great image. Um... And I think one of the things that we'll notice as we continue on is that um, almost every other race of children, it is very clear. There is a very clear point where they disappeared, like why they went away. And that just never happens with the fourth children. The fourth children um, definitely did not had no interest in burning out. They were happy to just fade away. So um, they were never they were never killed. They never died. They just stop being mentioned. Uh, it, it says they lost their purpose, whatever that ultimately means. Um, there's pretty sparse representation in the ruins. Um, it's mostly Bahamut. There's like um, uh, Mr. Fishman, uh, which by the way, if you didn't know, Mr. Fishman is actually a reference to um, to like uh, an old MSX uh, character. Um, I didn't know that. Supposedly, according to Naramura, the only reason why he made the fourth children fish is so that he could bring in Mr. Fishman. Uh, yeah, Gionin, um is what you sometimes refer to as well. But uh, like, he was like, I really just wanted to have the fish in there. So that's cool. Um, I guess just to kind of pull on a bunch of strings all at once, uh, the water in the spring in the sky is presumably the lake that Mygella carried. Um, this ends up forming Baron's waterfall on the surface. So if you um, connect up the, the areas you see that the water that um, Bahamut is in, the water that is up there, 
um, that flows out and forms the uh, Ba Run's waterfall on the surface. Um, the Spring in the Sky architecture is titled after Sumer, uh, ostensibly to, to try to keep a reference going to Oannes. Um, there's tons of Oannes wall carvings. Uh, there's like seven of them in Spring in the Sky alone. And there's even some that are outside of Spring in the Sky. There's, um, there's a room for Oannes in the Gate of Guidance. And I think, I think the Oannes stat, or the Oannes wall carving appears in a few other places too. Um, so... There's actually uh, kind of kind of an interesting thing to point out. There's actually multiple carvings of Mashusu in the main elevator shaft in Spring in the Sky. So Mashusu, um, I didn't mention it previously. Maybe I had intended to, but Mashusu is one of the um, eleven children of Tiamat in uh, in the dimensional corridor. Mashusu is the great chimera, kind of like eagle's wings and a lionish head. I don't remember what. It, it's ultimately supposed to look like a, a serpent with wings, like a winged serpent of some sort, um, depicted in La Mulana. Um, originally, it was meant to be just a, a serpent, like a legged serpent. Um, but there's a ton of carvings in the Spring in the Sky, so I started getting. To I was trying to figure out why would Spring in the Sky make reference to Mishusu. Uh That is a first children thing that's related to the first children. Spring in the Sky was made by the second children. It was lived in by the fourth children, perhaps decorated by the fourth children, I don't know. But but they don't have any relationship to um, Mishusu. So the question is, where did that come from? So in digging, what I ended up finding is that Spring in the Sky's theme being Sumerian lore um, it actually ends up lining up with uh, the Ishtar Gate, which is the eighth gate in Babylon. Um, the main elevator shaft doesn't just contain Mishusu dragons, but it also contains these depictions of lions. Um, these, like, really uh, big lions. And it ends up looking a lot like uh, the Ishtar Gate. So the Ishtar Gate is a great gate that's meant to show honor to... Um, three gods, uh, Ishtar, uh, Tiamat, and... No, sorry, Ishtar, uh, Marduk, and um, something else. I'm, I'm losing... I've lost my train of thought here. Uh, there was a third one. But ultimately, uh, the takeaway here is that in that... In the decoration of the Ishtar Gate, um, there are lions that are meant to represent Marduk... And, or sorry, the lions represent Ishtar and the Mashusu dragons are meant to represent Marduk. Um, and so the question ultimately is, what does it mean? What does it mean for this sort of obvious correlation to appear here, right? Uh, we have, you know, I'm, I'm just going to mouse over. I don't really care. We have uh, the Mashusu dragons appearing here. We have the lions appearing here. And I even pulled, there's these little like uh, triangle um, decorative, I don't know, decorative element in, in, uh, in this area, really close to these. I think it's meant to look like the top of the Ishtar gate. I think it's meant to be visually very similar. So I, 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 I don't have an answer to that question, but I think it's ultimately very interesting. Um, I think it's ultimately very interesting that uh, the Mashusu dragons appear here. And yeah, Sir Sky is mentioning that there's a lot of disparate elements in Spring in the Sky. Um, that's one of the things that's really easy to observe if you look at a map of Spring in the Sky all at once, is that depending on what region of Spring in the Sky you're looking at, uh, the architecture is incredibly different. If you look over by where the Philosopher is, there's these giant vaulted archways um, that kind of... I mean, it doesn't look like the Ishtar Gate, but, well, maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it is. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but there's a lot of, like, disparate villi uh, visual elements that um, all kind of come together to form the Spring in the Sky. And, and um, it's actually very beautiful to look at, um, but obviously it's hard to kind of draw any meaning from that. Yeah, the reliefs could have been built by later children. That's true. So anyway, uh, let's move on from the fourth children for now, uh, on to the fifth children. So the fifth children, uh, who were they? Well, they were ultimately just regular people. 
um, with knowledge of the skies. They weren't fish, they weren't uh, birds, they weren't any of those things. They were just ultimately people. Um, and this is one of our first uh, races, this is one of our first generations of children that start to look like a, a lot more like what we think of when we think of ancient humanity. While um, there was obviously um, elements of other cultures' religion in the previous children. You know, first children had Sumerian, uh, second children was its own thing. That doesn't really match. But like third children ended up having having Abrahamic and Greek and and all of these things. Um, the fifth children really just start to look like normal people. Um, I think that that's. I think that's what we're meant, how we're meant to look at it. Um, they had the power to make huge pyramids. Specifically, it's mentioned huge pyramids, which is the connection to the Temple of the Sun and Temple of the Moonlight. Um, Temple of Moonlight. Um, these two areas are almost certainly meant to be uh, implied that they were created by the fifth children, um, lived in by the fifth children. They were said to have tried to become gods, sought immortality, and created humans out of clay. Now, there's a lot going on in that description right there. Uh, we'll, we'll go through that for the most part. Um, we'll, we'll see what that means. Um, but ultimately, the, the culmination of the fifth children is that the mother... I don't know. I, I don't remember if it's specifically described that she, like, tired of the fact that they weren't fulfilling their purpose or what, but she ended up disrupting their language. And this is this is kind of um, very similar to like the, the the myth of the Tower of Babel, right? About disrupting language and, and forming multiple civilizations uh, because everyone suddenly speaks a different language. Um, this, is, this is really the first time that happens, right? Yeah, Elmac is not uh, one of the fifth children. Uh, Elmac is... Um, Mentioned in a moment, but specifically Elmac is um, a reference to... It's like a transliteration of the the proper name of the frilled neck lizard. I don't remember. It's like Ermac something. Um, but it's it it looks just like that. So that's, that's where Elmac comes from. Um, he's not... I don't think it's supposed to be implied necessarily that he's one of the fifth children. But this next slide actually specifically kind of disputes that. Because... Um, this, this, uh, this god that's up here in the corner, um, is at least implied to be Elmac. Um, it's mentioned, the, so the text for this scan right here mentions that, um, the sun is Aten, but that there is some frog-like creature uh, posed with it that's unnamed. And so my interpretation for that is that that's supposed to be um, Elmac. So while like formal Egyptian mythology, like Egyptian mythology as we know it, doesn't have an Elmac god, uh, I think that's what's being implied here is that Elmac is one of these, one, one of these friends. Um, so uh, Temple of the Sun draws really heavily on Egyptian mythology. Um, Temple of Moonlight draws on nothing. It's kind of its own strange techno... Techno-biological... Like, the field is very strangely themed, but it doesn't match any, like, known, arche uh, known archaeological references. Draws on Michael Jackson. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, uh, it, it just... For some reason, Aten is appear appears behind Elmac in that statue. So, um, in this picture, uh, I'm just going to go from left to right on the bottom. It's Osiris, Bastet, Anubis. Then in the middle, we've got Shu and Tefnut. And then on the right, we've got Nephthys, Thoth, and Set. Um, if, if you're familiar with uh, Egyptology, with... Um, Egyptian mythology, uh, all of these characters are so widely written about. There's, there's so many stories. There, there are, they are as well described as the Greek pantheon, pretty much. Um, there's just tons of stories surrounding the interactions of all of these different gods. Um, <clears throat> in this slide is also pictured the uh, Eye of Wedjet, you can see. Um, so I, I included the text. Uh, so if anyone ever asks you the question, uh, what the frick is a wedjet? 
you can tell them that you know what a Wedjet is. Uh, it is depicted in this slide. Um, so I, I have included, I have included a, a picture of a Wedjet here for you, um, so that you will know what that is. Sorry, Eye of Wedjet. My, my bad. I did not mean... You're right. Wedjet is another name for Horus. So, Eye of Wedjet. We've got our own Wedjet at home. Um, one of the things that was mentioned in the previous slide was that they um, created humans out of clay. And I guess you could kind of draw on this for uh, tried to become gods as well, but ultimately what they created was what was called the Tree of Life. So what is the Tree of Life? Well, the Tree of Life is a machine capable of creating people. This is what the fifth children created. Um, and th they, they did a great job. Uh, they created people. Um, they actually ended up using it to create the sixth children. We'll get to that in a second. Um... Yeah, normal invention used to create people. Sometimes you just want to create a people. Um, so you do. Um, there's actually a lot of folkloric traditions surrounding the idea of a tree of life. So just like I, I was mentioning off a handful of um, folkloric traditions around uh, like snakes in mythology, there's actually a ton of them for the tree of life as well. Uh, so for instance, like there's a Taoist story of a peach of immortality that grows from such a tree every 3,000 years, and anyone who eats the fruit receives immortality. Uh, that's what's depicted in the leftmost, so I'm just going left or right here with some of these, um, some of this art. Uh, there's the Garden of Eden, which the Garden of Eden, by the way, is not the Tree of Life, but in the story of the Garden of Eden, after, um, after Adam and Eve eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, they are thrown out of heaven, and there is a tree of life present inside uh, Eden that they want to get back to, but it's actually guarded uh, by cherubim with flaming swords. So that's that's how the story goes, is that they, they seek the knowledge that comes from the tree of life. They seek uh, what that tree of life offers them, uh, but they will never again be able to attain... Um, you know, the fruit that would grant them the gift of everlasting life uh, because of being thrown out of the Garden of Eden. Uh, there's the the tale of Gilgamesh. Uh, Gilgamesh is um, a Mesopotamian story. The Epic of Gilgamesh, there's a, a ton of stories inside there. One of them, if you, if you consider this to match up with it, um, is a story where Gilgamesh in his old age was seeking the plant of eternal youth. Um, so he was seeking the plan of eternal youth, and as the story goes, he, he found it. Uh, he, he was told of this plant that would grant him uh, youth, and he, he was taken out in a boat by someone else to go retrieve this plant, and the story is so fast, he just finds it. Like, he gets it. Wow, that was, that, there was like no effort. He just, he reached in and he grabbed the plant of eternal life, so awesome for him. Um, but he doesn't necessarily know whether or not to trust it, so he takes it, and his plan is, is he's going to go back uh, to town, and he's going to feed a little bit of it to one of the um, old people, elderly, infirm, something, in town. Uh, and essentially his idea is like, I'm going to feed a little bit of this plant of eternal youth to this person, and if they eat it, and they're suddenly young, then I'll know I can eat it. That's my plan. Um, and so he's heading back, and uh, it's a long journey, and so he goes to sleep. He lays down, goes to sleep, leaves the plant sitting on a rock, and a serpent comes by and eats it. Eats the whole plant. Yum, yum, yum. Eat it. It's in my belly. Which, um, the serpent eating the plant, uh, he sheds his skin instantly. It's supposed to be this, um... This tale of, of how snakes gain the ability to shed their skin. It's seen as uh, regaining their youth. Um, and so it's it's this sad story of Gilgamesh possibly being able to attain his youth again and falling short. Um, and then finally, the one that uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with is the story of Yggdrasil, uh, which is Norse mythology. Um, it's not, as far as I know, there's not a lot of stories around Yggdrasil, but uh, the idea is that... Um, Yggdrasil is the giant tree that kind of supports the strength of like the nine surrounding worlds. So, you know, there's um, there's Midgard, which is the place we live, and there's 
Asgard, Asgard, which is the place where there's tons of tons of areas, tons of tons of Norse areas. Great, neat. Um, so ultimately, what I'm trying to say here is that the the story of a tree of life, um, if if we if we remember that the idea of La Moana is and and this is actually a really important one to remember is that the story of yeah I was I I forgot it's not the veneer that live in sorry I trailed off because I forgot the name of the the people who live in Asgard um Aesir thank you that's the that's the word I couldn't live and the Valar lived in in uh in one of the there the Valar live in a different um, different world supported by I'm very bad at Norse mythology please grant me a pass to be away from this topic I've I've now realized that I've stepped too deep in it I'm too far all right so the takeaway here is to remember that the story of La Mulana is not that there are references to religion inside La Mulana, but rather the opposite. That La Mulana is the genesis of all of this. So the idea is, is that La Mulana contains the original and that people went out into the world to make copies. So people took everything from the ruins and took it out into the world to make copies. So when we see stories of Anubis in Egypt, the idea is, is that that story came from one of the fifth children inside La Mulana. When we hear a story about snakes being associated with mythology inside the ruins, that is where it went out and became part of mythology in the real world. And so, the takeaway from this is that the Tree of Life concept, the reason why it appears in so many different mythologies, is because it was born from mythology, or it was born from what happened, what was built by the fifth children inside La Mulana. So inside La Mulana, the fifth children built the Tree of Life. Then people went out from La Mulana into the real world, and each of the various religions got stories about a Tree of Life. So that's that's the broad idea of La Mulana. That's the, that's the general conceit that we all accept for the lore of La Mulana. Um, and so to take this one step further... The relationship between the Tree of Life uh, in La Mulana and the Tree of Life in Jewish mysticism. So if you've ever heard of uh, the Tree of Life in the context of Kabbalah, uh, the Trees of Life in La Mulana appear in the Gate of Illusion and Chamber of Birth. And they look like they're depicted right here in the bottom right. And they look surprisingly, shockingly similar to the tree of life that appears in the traditions of Kabbalah. So if you're not familiar with what Kabbalah is, it's uh, it's Jewish mysticism. It's uh, it, it has traditions that range from much more holistic, following in the general tenets of uh, Judaism. While it's not mainstream Judaism, it is born of mainstream Ju Judaism, all the way to sort of the way more fringe and outlandish Hermetic Kabbalah that was adapted to uh, adapted for the purposes of Western esotericism. So things like tarot and and um, astrology and all the things that that were born from Western esotericism, uh, Kabbalah does play a role in that. Um, this depiction of the Tree of Life looks so much like the Tree of Life in La Mulana that we can start to generate some comparisons, right? So the Tree of Life in Kabbalah uh, has ten sephirot, uh, which are these nodes that are connected by paths. Um, and just comparing them visually, you can already see the distinction. So for instance, there is a missing... Uh, there, there is a, a node missing on the left-hand side that is present on the right-hand side. And then that bottom node in the Tree of Life, uh, the Kabbalah Tree of Life, is not present in the Tree of Life in La Mulana. And so what conclusions can we draw from that comparison? Well, in some drawings of the Tree of Life, in some... I guess, traditions of Kabbalah, the Tree of Life does actually have that node that's missing, and that node is Dot, uh, which represents knowledge. So, it's missing in some representations, but it's present in the version in La Mulana. Does that mean something? Does it mean something 
for knowledge to be the node that is present in La Mulana? Do we do the creatures that are in La Mulana somehow have a greater sense of knowledge of their creator than is implied by the Tree of Life in Kabbalah? Or, for instance, uh, the node that's at the very bottom in the Tree of Life in Kabbalah is Malkuth. I, I'm certain I'm pronouncing that wrong, but I, I do apologize if I am pronouncing it wrong. Malkuth, uh, which represents the concept of the kingdom. And the kingdom is like the expression of the divine within the physical world. While it's most most separated from uh, Keter, is, is it Keter, uh, is the top one. While it's most, while, while it's, while it's most separated from Keter, uh, it also is quite closely connected. The idea is that um, in, in our physical world, we have those manifestations of the divine, and so it's still an important piece of the concept of humanity's relationship with, with uh, God. Interestingly, the, the, the Malkuth uh, node in the Tree of Life is actually at the exact position where creatures are born from, in the Tree of Life in La Mulana. So we can draw some parallels there. Does that mean that these creatures are the expression of the divine in the physical world? Maybe that's a, a way that you can... Um, maybe that's a way that you can interpret that. Again, this this is not something that's supported by the text. There's no text in La Mulana that says any of these things, but it's just interesting to draw the correlations between... Uh, some of the iconography that comes from Kabbalah and some of the iconography that we see in La Mulana and try to try to match them up as, as best as possible. Well, speaking of Skanda, let's move on to the six children. So, what were the six children? Well, the six children were born of the Tree of Life, built by the fifth children. Um, there were tons of children in this generation. So we were just chock a -bock full of children. Um, and it wasn't just... So most of the generations were all fairly, I mean, fairly homogenous. It was, you know, they were all flying creatures or they were all fish or they were all, you know, giants or something like that. But the six children actually had a lot of variety to them. They were, uh, there were tons of them born, some of them giant, some of them small. Um, they built their own vehicles that could fly. That's kind of interesting. Uh, Mulbrook specifically mentions that they were responsible for connecting the ruins, which I think is a fascinating topic to kind of just lose yourself in for a moment. To think about what does it mean for the six children to connect the ruins? Well... You know, if the Giants built all of these fields, if the Giants built, let, let's say because they built the vast majority of them, we'll just, we'll grant them, we'll just say, let's say the, the Giants built all the fields. They didn't, but let's leave it at that for a moment. Well, the connections between the fields are not giant-sized. The doors are not giant-sized. The ladders are not giant-sized. So the connections were sized like the six children. So you can kind of see... You can kind of see the way that they did actually do this. This isn't just like a store. Oh, they connected the ruins. They made it all match up. Like, they actually were responsible for a lot of the pathways that we tread throughout the game. They build these doors. They build these ladders. They actually connected things properly. They tried to bring the giants, the second children, back to life. Uh, they went to war out on the surface. Um, and they actually were the first children to not be born of the mother. Um, which, it may not be obvious why that's such a, like, you know, a, a an eye-opening thing, but the, we're talking about children of the mother, and we've encountered our first generation of children that were not born of the mother. They may have had knowledge of the mother, they may have had that DNA of the mother, but this was the first generation that the mother did not build. She kind of lost interest. It's it said specifically that she seems to have lost interest in creating more children. Maybe she became increasingly hopeless that uh, the children would be able to fulfill their purpose. Uh, maybe she was tired of being constantly disappointed. Um, I feel like I'm just saying a lot of things that are going to make people say relatable. Um, but just ultimately, it's just... It's fascinating within the framework of La Mulana that we're encountering our first 
uh, children that were not creative mother. Yeah, she definitely could have been getting weaker. And I think there's reason to think that that might be true, that she did become weaker over time. Um, but while I don't have necessarily an answer for what that quote unquote means, I think it is interesting to talk about like what it means to, uh, to have children of the mother that were not created by the mother. Yeah, I think there might be something in the text that I forgot to pull that implies that she, she, she became too weak to continue creating children. So it, it's also really interesting to talk about this because the fifth children were not the first children to create people, right? Like, the first children created people. They created their children. Tiamat created children. Nua, at least mythologically, not necessarily in the ruins, created children. I, I had the idea for a long time that possibly because Nua is associated with tr creating children out of clay in her mythology, that... Um, that that necessarily meant that the mud men that we see in La Mulana are uh, newest children. I no longer believe that that's true. So if that's your theory, uh, j I just don't agree. But that's it's fine. A lot of this is interpretive. Um, it's just interesting that the first children were said to have the power to create life, and they did so imperfectly, and that those children did not count as another generation. And yet the sixth or the fifth children made a tree of life, and boom, we've got the six children. So it's just it's kind of it's just interesting. Yeah, the the text about the mother losing the power to create children may have come from Lumalon too. I don't know, um, but. Uh, I do have some recollection of some text somewhere implying that, so. Anyway, so who are the six children then? Um, here you go. Here's a freebie for you. Uh, the mudmen that we see coming out of the Tree of Life are not the six children. For some of you, that may be surprising. For many of you, it may not. Um, but the mudmen that we see in the Chamber of Birth are not six children. We will talk about what they are. Uh, but they are not six children. Um, what we do know about them is that they are a race of people who worshipped Hindu gods. I don't know whether or not there were a lot of other gods being worshipped by the six children, um, but Mulbrook has two full screens full of dialogue where she just rattles off the names of Hindu gods that the six children were known for worshipping. So I think it's pretty heavy-handed that they, um, that, that they were, um, worshipping Hindu god. I mean, just specifically. Um, they were capable of building great things. They were builders just like the second children were. Um, and it specifically mentioned that um, that they wanted to bring back the giants. And this is actually where the lore of Mausoleum of the Giants starts to come back, because it becomes obvious at this point that the six children were responsible for building the Mausoleum of the Giants in an effort to pay homage to the children who they revered very clearly in a lot of their actions, words, deeds, what they built, how they acted. They very clearly uh, had a ton of reverence for the second children. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting point that I never really thought about, Liz. That's that's a really fascinating point. So Liz say uh, Liz says um, fascinating that anyone would worship gods while knowing about the mother. Does that imply that these gods might actually exist in the universe? Maybe. That's actually a really interesting thought. Uh, why did they worship Hindu god or you know gods that we associate with the Hindu religion? Uh, why did they know about these gods and worship them? knowing that the mother was their creator. Uh, it's just kind of, it's interesting. Maybe maybe it's more along the lines of those Hindu gods are also supposed to be six children and that they just had reverence for them and maybe it's elaborated too much, but I think that's a fascinating idea and we could definitely go down that rabbit hole quite a lot. Um, there's, there's a lot going on there. Some of the six children... Uh, yes, they are specifically mentioned to have knowledge of the mother. They had advanced knowledge. Um, what? It's actually the seventh children who had the advanced knowledge. I I think the six children did know about the mother, though. Um, I 
Yeah, I think everyone was aware of the mother until the eighth children. Yeah, let's try to keep most of the La Milana 2 retcons out. Um, we're, we're trying to take this from a holistic uh, La Milana 2 spoiler-free perspective. Um, if you want to go into spoiler chat on my Discord and chat about some of the La Milana 2 stuff that this brings up, but for the most part, let's let's do try to keep um, La Milana 2 out of it as much as possible. Um, so two of the creations, or we can call them six children, or we can call them born of the six children, whatever, uh, were Skanda and Palenque. Um, Sakit was definitely built by the six children. If you'll notice, I, I mean, you know, I enhanced by stretching the picture. Um, but uh, you can see that there's actually uh, Lamalani 6 on its ankle, um, which is definitely supposed to refer back to the fact that that was built by the six children as an homage to Sakit. So that is not Sakit. Uh, who knows where Sakit actually is? Definitely not me. Um, it does kind of um, lead to a few questions, though. Um, why would they want to bring back the second children? Like, what... 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 Why did they place the second children in such high esteem? Um, there's a few theories I can offer. Uh, I don't... I don't know how much of them are right, but I, I depend on them to make further claims down the road. So you'll either agree with me or disagree with me. It doesn't really matter to me whether or not you agree with me, but um, I, I can... I can at least give you an idea of what my perspective is about why they held the second children in such high esteem. So, uh, they were built of, of, they were built of clay and they were great builders. They were capable of building a great many things. And I think being builders, they may have held the second children in high esteem because they were also builders. Um, that's most of my theory is that like, there's this, um, sort of almost vocational connection between them, that they see themselves as being connected by both of them taking part in this ritual construction within the ruins. Um, I think it's important to decide for yourself why it is that they are specifically and emphatically connected to the second children, um, because it's going to come up later their relationship. So whatever reason you think that is, um, you have to come up with something that's going to stick for you. Um, but anyway. So let's uh, let's go from here. Let's talk about Skanda. Um, first off, he's doing his best. Please love him. Uh, so where does Skanda come from in... Uh, Folklore. Well, Skanda is another name for a character, Kartikeya, um, the Hindu god of war, which is often associated with youthful vigor and swift aggression. And specifically in Sanskrit, Skanda translates to leaper or attacker. Um, I'm going to make a huge reach later, which will explain why I'm mentioning this. Um, but Skanda is sometimes depicted as riding a peacock. I'm going to make the world's biggest reach, the world's greatest reach, and it's going to strongly depend on you remembering Skanda being depicted often in Hindu art as uh, riding a peacock. Um, as for where Skanda sort of, um, why Skanda fits in here, um, Skanda also has extra notoriety because he was, um, through the process of cultural diffusion, uh, accepted into the Chinese Buddhi uh, Buddhist pantheon, um, and ultimately was merged with a character named, I'm, I'm never going to be good at pronouncing uh, Chinese words, but Wei uh, I, I will, it's a, it's a, it's a language that has a lot of uh, tonal meaning, and I will never uh, get the tone right, but um, Wei Tio is the name of the character who, at this point, we would say Skanda has another name, but at least at the time where Skanda was sort of adopted into the Chinese Buddhist pantheon, um, it was actually like he was kind of copied over that character. That character was a famous general, um, warlike 
aggressive and um, their their characters merged. Um, the name is also known as Idaten in Japanese. I'm also pronouncing that poorly. Um, which that name and that character are important to followers of the Zen tradition. He's known as a protector of monasteries and known for a miraculous speed. So the, the depiction in the bottom there is the one from Hindu tradition. And the depiction on the top is the depiction from Buddhist tradition. Um, there's there's a lot of stories about Skanda. Um, the the name Idaten in Japanese is actually part of a phrase. I can't remember what the full phrase is, but the phrase is like you know um, you know run, like if you're running really fast, you know in English we might say you're beating feet or you know just like a casual phrase for for running really fast. Um, there is a phrase in Japanese that includes the name Idaten, and I don't remember the. Um, I don't remember what the phrase is, but essentially, uh, people might be familiar with that name. Um, there's a famous story in, uh, in Buddhist folklore of the Buddha. He was dying, he was on his deathbed, and something was stolen from him. I don't even remember what it was. Something was stolen from him, and, uh, it was specifically Skanda who sort of, like, raced to catch the culprit and retrieve the thing that was stolen. I don't... Yeah, there's an anime called... Uh, 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 an anime about Idaten. I, I know this because the more I tried to research Idaten, the more Google thought I'm really into anime now. Um... Thank you, Ninten. Um... It's also worth mentioning here, um, I just, I think this is kind of an interesting point to make, is that it's not so much that the six children had small creatures, had giants, but rather it's a byproduct of the, um, the tree of life itself. Y you've probably noticed, but the tree of life that Skanda comes out of is actually much larger. And so it's worth noting that it's very possible that this much larger tree of life is just the one that bore all of the giants, and that all of the much smaller ones bore, I guess, what I would consider average-sized creatures. Um, Yeah, if, you, if you've played La Mulana, then you know that uh, if you were to characterize Skanda's behavior, it's that he runs really fast at you. That's his whole attack, is just running really fast at you and being unpredictable, which really matches very closely the concept of uh, Kartikeya and Skanda. Um, Now let's talk about Palenque. If you're not aware, Palenque um, in the real world is actually the name of a Mayan city-state. It's not the name of a person. Um, Palenque was a Mayan city-state that was ultimately abandoned by the 7th century. Um, it, it thrived from like 200 AD to like the late 600s AD. And ultimately it wasn't that it was like destroyed or anything, but it just kind of fizzled out. Um, less construction was happening there and... Um, just as a culture, it, it wound down up to the point where um, when the Spaniards, when the Spaniards were coming through that area in like the 1500s, um, there was, there was basically no one living there anymore. It was basically nothing. I, I've done a great deal of research to, to figure out how to pronounce this and it is Palenque. I feel, I feel confident. I feel strong about it. Um. The most, <coughs> pardon me, the most well-known king of Palenque was um, uh, a king named Pakal the Great. Um, that That is what he's often known as to Westerners, or to Anglo Ang Anglophones. Those pesky Anglos. Um, and this uh, depiction in the bottom left, um, the big white image there, is actually the image of Pakal the Great from his tomb. This isn't from La Milana. This is what he looked like in his tomb. Um, 
And you can kind of see really, really clearly exactly how uh, he came to look like he did in La Mulana. Um, this depiction, I mean, you know, probably isn't showing any great machine or anything like that. But if you look at it in the right way, it definitely lends credence to um, the heavily disputed, uh, completely ignored theory of ancient astronauts. There's a lot of um, cave drawings and, and etchings and things like, even things like this that are often pointed at and said, here are examples of ancient astronauts. And um, first off, it's an entirely discredited theory. Uh, basically, if you want to support the theory of ancient astronauts, you have to make up stuff out of whole cloth. Um, but, hey, did you notice that Pakal the Great looks like he's riding a spaceship? So anyway, uh, here's our Gradius shooter. Um, on the right, you can see Palenque's uh, coffin in the bottom left. That's the... Um, Sorry, I guess it's in the middle, actually. But it, in the bottom middle, the the sort of reddish-purplish image is the um, Palenque's coffin um, before the fight starts. Um, you can see him riding on what looks to be a spaceship. I, I mean, if you, if you told me this was a guy riding a spaceship, I'd say, heck yeah. Um, and then uh, on the right, that's what he looks like during the actual fight. And more so than really anything else that happens in... In La Milana, this is absolutely drawn directly from uh, a depiction in the real world uh, to a fascinating extent. Uh, I just think I think this is one of the few examples where the game pulled something cool out of re out of real life um, anthropology and made a neat thing out of it. Hey, what about the Chamber of Extinction? Uh, so the Grail tablet for the Chamber of Extinction says, Behold the Chamber of Extinction. Here lies the remnants of a disastrous battle. Um, and so a reasonable question might be, um, Hey, what battle? Um, we know that the six children went to war out on the surface, but the only war we know about within the ruins is the second children. Um, the, the giants. Um, I don't have a great answer here. I think that I have some ideas, but I don't have a great answer here. Um, I think that there are a lot of good reasons to point to the six children being the ones that went to war. Um, and the question is, why did they go to war? Um, some of them were giants, thanks to the larger tree of life in Skanda's room. Um, which may have led to some of their fixation on the second children. Um, they also built the Mausoleum of the Giants to honor them. And so it's possible that knowing their lore, if they, if they kind of read the tablets, because those tablets were written by Abuto during the age of the second children, um, considering that they kind of seem to be trying their hardest to follow in the footsteps of the second children, maybe they saw war as... Maybe they saw war as the obvious eventuality. You know, they didn't have a purpose of their own. It's not... Yeah, Mulbrook says it's not clear what they were trying to accomplish. Um, maybe they just thought that what they were supposed to do was fulfill exactly what the second children did. They tried to build uh, a flying machine. They had giants. They uh, added to the ruins. They built the ruins. And they thought, what's next? Uh, let's fight. I, I don't think that that's a satisfying answer, but I think that that's the closest we're going to get to. Um, I think that's the closest thing to a, a good-ish answer that we're going to have here. Um, I, I, I love any theory you might have, but it's ultimately um, unsatisfying in a lot of ways. We know that the Chamber of Extinction was owned by the six children. There are certain archaeological elements that make that obvious. For instance, you can't really see it very well. In the background of this slide is the screen where Palenque's mural is. 
um, there is a giant uh, carving of what looks like an almost futuristic pharaoh, um, which is supposed to be sort of the iteration on the fifth children. So it's like the fifth children growing up. They took the pharaoh iconography and they iterated upon it, made it more futuristic. Um, and so we know that the Chamber of Extinction is associated with the six children. The question is, uh, did they live there and was that the battle that's being mentioned? I think probably because um, for it to have been the second children, the Chamber of Extinction would have had to exist then. And we don't know that the Chamber of Extinction existed. We don't know that it didn't. There's a great many chambers we don't know much about at all. But we, know, we don't know that it existed during the era of the second children. And the only other children that we know of specifically that went to war was, um, well, the the fifth children did as well. But um, I was going to mention the third children were said to go to war, but they went, on, went to war on the surface. So um, it's kind of hard to answer this question. If you follow the text explicitly, every other war is specifically said to have happened on the surface. And so it kind of rules everyone out but the second children, but I don't think that the second children make sense. That's, that's my answer. Uh, it's not great. It's just my answer. Uh, some some things that we see, some other uh, giants that we see, we have Hecatonchires, which is... Um, it, it's a figure that comes from an archaic stage of Greek mythology. There were actually three giants of incredible strength and ferocity that surpassed all of the titans whom they helped overthrow. Uh, these were men who had... Um, 50 heads, 100 arms, that's how they were supposed to have been depicted. Uh, there was also Argus Panoptus, which was a many-eyed giant in Greek mythology. Um, Mulbrook specifically mentions when we talk about the second children, she mentions that some of the giants went to the surface. And I'm inclined to think that when she says that giants went to the surface, that Argus is probably that one. So it's perfectly fine if you want to rule out Argus from this. Um, but I think it's implied here, I think it's possible to think that Hecaconchires might actually be like a, um, almost like a misfire from the Tree of Life. Like, if the Tree of Life was supposed to be creating men from clay, men with one head and two arms, then a misfire that kind of prints over itself 50 times would produce 50 heads and 100 arms. So it's possible that Hecatonchires, Hecatonchires is actually one of the six children, but it's kind of like a, a, a bastardization. It's kind of a, a, a mutation, if you will, of, of the six children. And if you, if you like that answer, uh, hey, you're welcome. I'm happy to have provided it to you. If you uh, like it, if you don't like it, I don't know, make your own damn slide deck. Um, there's also, uh, so here's some images of Argus here, um, how he's depicted in Greek mythology versus how he's depicted in, um, La Mulana. I will point out, um, I think it's worth mentioning here, is that, um, Skanda, so, so how, so maybe how does Skanda fit into this? Well... Hold on, I, I'm trying to make sure that my train of thought that I have here is going to work. Um, no, actually, my train of thought isn't going to work here. I, I have a mistake in, in my reasoning, and I'm just now seeing it once I look at it and I'm about to read it. So I'm not going to read it. Um, I'm satisfied with this. Ultimately, what I wanted to point out was that Argus is probably a second child, but could have been sixth. That Heka can carry, I think, is almost certainly a sixth child. I feel confident that uh, Heka can carry is a sixth child. Um, that's that's my uh, approach toward it. Before we move on um, to the next children, it's worth mentioning for a moment. Uh, what about the fairies? So. The fairies were originally envisioned to be seventh children. In the original art for the game, you can actually see them fairly clearly depicted with um, with sevens on them. Um, so here is the fairy queen with a seven on her belt buckle. 
but during the port to the Vita, um, with the addition of the encyclopedia, so Naramura was including more lore and information about these characters, uh, one of the changes that was made for the Vita port and uh, further ports was that information um, was changed to make them actually six children. Um, I don't have any theory about this meaning anything special. I just want to point out that the fairies also fall into the six children, um, which means ultimately that they very well may have been created from the tree of life as well, but they're obviously distinctly different from from any of the other... Um, they're, they're obviously distinct from any other uh, creature of the sixth generation, so... Um, Take that as just an observation. Uh, I'm, I'm pointing out to you that the fairies are, are six children. Yeah, that's a great point, Glum. I didn't even think about that. The, uh, the stray fairy that's responsible for guarding the Tree of Life um, is, uh, is obviously one of the fairies of the sixth generation. Um... There's a few things that I wanted to include in these slides that I didn't, um, and I think now is a time to mention it. One thing that I want to mention is that the text for, so if you recall the trials in the Chamber of Illusion, nope, Gate of Illusion, um, the three trials that are used to unlock the uh, Tree of Life, one of them refers to a character named Ba, and the specific text says that Ba um, had chanted a, let me, let me make sure I get the text right. Let me, I, I just want to look it up because I think it's important that I say the text correctly. A lot of text with ball on it. Okay, that's not super helpful. Um, I'll find it really quickly. I think it's worth pulling up. Chamber of... Illusion. Gate of Illusion. Struggling to find it really quickly. I will get this. I feel like it's important. Gate of Illusion. Here we go. Uh, ba. Ba, ba. Here we go. Um, a grieving bird cast a spell without the mother's knowledge, so the mistakes would not be repeated and the cycle of sadness would end. The large bird cast a spell. Should the bird die, the spell shall break, and the pillar of light shall disappear. I leave this behind and pass it down in the same state of mind as the bird of the face. So that's specifically referring to the creature Ba. And the question I would pose here is, what is the spell that it cast? Um, and I think it's kind of interesting to look at that and see that Ba, uh, along with some of the other tasks that were happening, were specifically trying to power down the Tree of Life. Um, I think that one of the things about these six children being aimless, for lack of a better word, is that they recognized the futility of their actions, and they wanted to stop creating more six children. Um, I think uh, it's kind of interesting to look at that and realize that uh, it's the only instance mentioned of something like that. Ba... Uh, specifically was responsible for chanting a spell to power down the Tree of Life. Um, and I, I just think it's... Uh, I, I think it's worth giving it a moment uh, to to sink that in. Um, if that matters. Alright. So time for the Seventh Children now. And... Uh, I'm just going to warn you right now, um, as we start to go into the seventh children, so all of the other children lived inside the ruins, and they lived their lives out inside the ruins, and were really, really heavily documented by the, um, by the seventh children. So we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but um, the seventh children uh, were responsible for recording a lot of this information, reporting a lot of this information, if you want to even put it that way. Um, a lot of what we're going to talk about from this point forward really, really gets more and more speculative. I'll do my best to give references for why I think certain things are true or where my opinions are coming from or where these thoughts are, are derived from. Uh, but it is becoming increasingly uh, speculative at this point. So who were the seventh children? 
Uh, the seven children included Mulbrook, the philosophers, and the villagers living outside the ruins. So specifically the gate of depart or the village of departure. Not like the whole world are seven children, but rather specifically um, the villagers living uh, in the village of departure are, are meant to be seven children as well. Um, they were born of the tree and li tree of life. Uh, that's kind of an interesting note, is that they actually came from the Tree of Life, uh, but it was empowered by the mother with advanced knowledge. So it's almost like uh, the, mo the mother took a break for a generation, the six children were created and had nothing to do with, uh, with the mother. They knew of her, but they were not her creation, and almost like she infused some power into the Tree of Life in order to begin the creation of the seventh children. It's like she... <laughs> The mother has logged back in, and she comes in and uh, and creates the uh, the the power to imbue the seventh children with this advanced knowledge. Um, unfortunately for the mother, uh, this additional knowledge um, mostly comprised wishing for the mother's death. Uh, but they knew from their experience, and by experience I mean like researching the previous civilizations and things like that, they knew that their knowledge of the mother was the thing that would prevent them from being able to fulfill this task, would prevent them from being able to kill the mother. Yeah, I, I think I, I definitely see where you're coming from there. Glum says that the mother using the tree indeed implies that she's losing power. And I think that's definitely true. I think that the fact that she had to lean on uh she had to lean on the tree of life in order to create new generations in the way she wanted to create them, uh, would definitely suggest that she was losing some power. Thank you, Alta. So who are the philosophers? Uh, this is kind of an interesting question, I think. I think it's a more interesting question than you realize. Like, what is a philosopher? Like, what makes them different than anyone else? Um, so the philosophers are said to be four members of the seven children that set themselves apart by their accomplishments. Um, one one bit of text I can draw from here is that Dracuet, uh, Dracuet being Mulbrook's father, a character that we meet in the DLC, and this is all the DLC stuff I will mention. Dracuet says, I am the one who could not become a philosopher. I created a treasure, but it was acknowledged by none, and thus I failed to become a philosopher. So obviously, being a philosopher is something that you... Uh, you attain, right? It is, a, it is a honor. It is it is something that is bestowed upon you for uh, for accomplishments. Um, and I think <clears throat> it's possible to ask the question here: Did the philosophers create treasures? That's fine. We will uh, we will address that point. Um, some of you might say yes, and some of you might say maybe, and some of you might say who cares. And you'll be happy to know that every single one of those answers is correct. Um, also, the philosophers were responsible for most of the tablets and most of the puzzles. Um, they were not responsible for all the tablets because some of them are signed by other other people. So, unless the philosophers sometimes decided to write in ancient Lamulanese, a completely different dialect from Lamulanese, or unless the the uh, philosophers were just completely, um, you know, uh, forging other people's signatures, essentially. Uh, they were not responsible for all the tablets. And they're also not responsible for all the puzzles either, because there's definitely puzzles that characters inside the ruins are obviously setting for you. So they aren't responsible for all the puzzles. But the vast majority of the tablets and the vast majority of the puzzles were uh, the philosophers. Uh, Zelpid specifically says, those that set them com complex traps in the ruins are waiting for the strong one. Um, and at this point, it's worthwhile to just press pause for a moment. It's worthwhile to just press pause and say, now wait a second. That means that all of the effort that we go through, all of the effort that Lameza goes through in order to challenge the ruins, all of this was just a game. The philosophers just created this giant game. Um, by the way, on the right are depicted all of the philosophers from top to bottom. It's Gilatorio, Alcidana, Samaranta, and Phobos. Those are the four philosophers. Um, 
it's also worth asking the question. I don't have an answer. I don't. I don't plan to present a theory here, um, but it's worth asking the question. Zelpud passes emails to you constantly throughout the game where he either outright tells you the solutions to some puzzles, heavily implies solutions to the puzzles, or something else that kind of points at him having some advanced knowledge of these puzzles. And so a question worth asking is, did he also play a significant role in creating these puzzles? Is he a philosopher? I don't I don't have an answer, and I don't really think that the answer to that question matters all that much, but I think it's interesting to realize that Zelpa knew a lot of information for someone who wasn't part of the task of setting the traps and building the puzzles. Um, It's also mentioned by the Stray Fairy specifically that, um, so the Stray Fairy says this place gives birth to evil life under orders of the four philosophers, which I think is also a really great place to stop and pause. Um, it is a very specific admonition to call it evil life. Um, and so we have to ask the question, why was it evil life? Uh, why was the life that the four philosophers made the tree of life produce, why was it evil? Um, now, an easy answer, and I think perhaps still a, a, a relatively valid answer, would be that they were just creating creatures, monsters. Not children of the mother, but just creatures that could challenge La Mesa, right? You're, they're looking for a hero, they're looking for a strong person, and so they tell the machine, hey, make a bunch of jerks, right? And I think that that's a fine interpretation, but I think that there is a through line to this story, that we're definitely going to uh, reach a crescendo on at the very end of this. Uh, I think there's a through line to the story of us being suspicious of the philosophers. I think it's helpful for us to adopt a healthy level of skepticism and uh, doubt for the philosophers. Um, I, I offer the question without answering it, are the philosophers bad guys? I'm not, I'm, by the end of this, you may draw your own conclusion, you may have an answer to this question, but I think it's just worth throwing this question out there. Are the philosophers bad guys? Are they, on one level or another, villains? As far as um, La Milani's iconography uh, goes, in the bottom left you can see what is referred to as the Philosopher's Sigil. Um, it's literally just the Lamalani's number seven with four dots around it. Uh, not the most creative sigil in the world. Um, and each of the Philosophers also has its own, has his own sigil. So, um, when you talk to the Philosophers and they enact changes in the ruins, you will see their individual sigils and you can see what they look like if you'd like to. For what it's worth, this is why I specifically wanted to circle back and mention the evil life are the mudmen that we see. These are not the six children. So those mudmen, as much as you might want to think of them as six children, because the fifth children use the tree of life to make the six children, those are not the six children. I think that this is the point where I have to raise the question... Was the creature that Lameza fights in Skanda's room actually Skanda? For whatever definition you're willing to accept, for what is actually Skanda, quote unquote, is that Skanda? Is that yet more evil life that's created? Because there is a tablet that describes Skanda as a clay doll, but it doesn't say it's this clay doll. It doesn't say that this clay person that you are fighting is Skanda. So I think, and, and there, there is more to come down the road in this, in this presentation where I will try to address that at least a little bit, but it's worth asking here, is that actually Skanda? So... Well, Skanda's room is where Skanda was, so he could guard the Pochette key, but Okay. I, I will I will I will consider that a, a perfectly valid um, 
counterpoint to my theory. So. <laughs> so at this point, we know that the philosophers are creating a challenge for a hero. We know that they've created puzzles. And so at this point, it's worthwhile for us to start talking about the biggest puzzle in the game. So the mantra puzzle. So here's where I have to do a little bit to explain how the mantra puzzle works. If you've never played La Milana, this is me spoiling for you the largest puzzle in the game. Um, and the idea here is that the front and back side fields, you know, gate of guidance on the front, gate of illusion on the back, or mausoleum of the giants on the front, uh, graveyard of the giants on the back. Um, these have a correspondence, so they match up in a very specific way. Um, they match up front to back, um, and it's not where the door is. That would be, oh, I, were it to be that easy, um, you actually have to recognize that there is an anchor point provided by a cross of light. There are several tablets in the game that explain this. I didn't include them in here. But there's, there's tablets that mention that the cross of light is the point at which the front side and the back side connect, essentially. And so you have to do a little bit of geometry, knowing that the uh, that the fields tessellate, right? They have, remember, again, I'm going back to that idea that the fields have 20 screens each, and they can be reconfigured to fit in a 4x5 grid. And so what you have to do is you have to figure out what room with a cross of light in one corresponds to which room with a cross of light in the other, and then figure out, essentially, where do I need to chant a mantra? So the power to unseal the mother and force her spirit to take a corporeal form that we can fight uh, was a puzzle that was created by the philosophers, obviously. And so we have to figure out how they connect. We have to figure out what that front-to-back connection is. And then we have to go to the room that corresponds to the guardian's room, but on the opposite side. So, for instance, uh, the guardian of dimensional corridor, the opposite side is uh, the endless corridor. We have to go to essentially what would be Tiamat's room, but in the endless corridor in order to chant the mantra. That, uh, that is the biggest puzzle in the game. It has a lot of moving parts. It's very challenging. And if you've played La Mulana, there is a better than average chance that you just brute force that puzzle because that seems to be a common theme uh, that most people just brute force the puzzle. It's, despite how complicated it is, one of the easiest puzzles to brute force. Um, We know that this entire process, this power, the mantras, the wedges, um, all came from the philosophers. They created this entire process. Uh, the tablets say it's a hidden, or sorry, um, the, so this is text from one of the philosophers. He says, it's a hidden technique that we, the seventh children, created. I shall tell thee how it is done. Drive eight wedges into the mother's body. Take the Jed Pillar and Magatama Jewel in hand and recite the mantra. The mantra has been inscribed upon the markers. Drive the wedges from the heels. Drive the wedges from the heels is not exactly a great uh, translation, but ultimately it's saying um, to go to the location where the wedge should be and drive it from one side to the other, which is what chanting the mantra essentially does. Um, other tablets say things like eight wedges will give form to the soul. So we know that if we do this process, that this will make the mother corporeal. It will give form to the soul. Um, and that the mother is currently sleeping. And that it's this this wedge process uh, that will, will wake her. So we know that the mantras have to be chanted at the location on the back side. Corresponding to the guardian's location on the front side. Neat. Uh, neat. Good. So what does it matter? Is the, like, the question is, what does it matter? Um, and so, before I answer the question of why, before I answer uh, a few points on why, let's talk about a complete guide to the references hidden within the mantras. You thought the presentation was over because I was this far through. Think again! Um, so we're going to talk about the references hidden within all the mantras. Now, it's not necessarily the case that um, we need to talk about all of them at length. Um, 
because most a lot of these are self-explanatory but i did want to uh go back through and just make sure that it's obvious why each mantra is what it is so the first one is marduk so chant these words the name of the god the child of god who doth defy tiamat the name of the root of all suffering the one that brought the 11 demons upon us marduk so uh marduk as I've mentioned several times in this discussion, uh, Tiamat was slain by Marduk in mythology, um, who eventually formed the heavens and earth with her body. Um, her being slain could be seen as um, as uh, the thing that freed the eleven demons, her children, who gave them uh, life. Uh, ultimately, that's not quite accurate because it required us to kill the 11 demons in order to bring Tiamat into being. But I mean, we kind of fulfilled the ritual, uh, the, the ritual that Marduk did, right? Marduk killed Tiamat. We, we killed Tiamat. Uh, we're, we're, we're brothers. We're the best. Um, we already did this one. So anyway, next one, uh, Sabat. So this is uh, the second mantra. It's the one to strike Baphomet's wedge. So uh, the text reads, chant these words, Baphomet's feast to which the witches flock. The name of the place where the summoned demon shall return, Sabbat. Um, now, what is Sabbat? It doesn't really matter all that much. Um, the, the term specifically is a reference to the witch's Sabbath, um, which is this idea that, um, you know, during the 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 rise of the popularization of the theory that there were witches among us um that witches would like gather out in the woods and they would have these these raucous uh gatherings that would um summon demons and would would honor them and revere them and that this is just what witches did they got together they had a great time they partied uh whatever um now Despite the fact that there's, like, literally no proof of this ever happening, um, this was the theory, um, and it gained popularity in the 20th century. Um, it, specifically here, we can kind of see where uh, Sabat came from, uh, because in order to summon Baphomet, we have to kind of invade this raucous party of witches. Um, I think... I think the bestiary refers to them as druids, if I'm not mistaken. I, I could be wrong. I don't think that they're referred to as witches. I don't know if I remember what they're referred to as, but um, they're uh, they're definitely the witches that are meant to summon Baphomet's Ankh. So um, I, I think it's obvious the way that this mantra plays a role in um, in sort of the lore of Baphomet. And what we'll find as we go on is that, um, for the most part, all the mantras have a specific meaning that's special to the, um, the, the guardian that's, the wedge that it corresponds to, essentially. So this next one, uh, so Mu, um, is the, uh, mantra to strike Palenque's wedge. Uh, the text reads, chant these words, the name of the one with no name, the name of the one who soars to the skies, the great one with no name, Mu. And the important question here, I think, is why is Mu of any relevance to the six children? Um, as far as we're concerned, we, we, we see it as being connected to the second children, but the second children and the six children have this sort of unbreakable bond. Uh, as, the more we talk about the six children, it feels like we're just talking about Second Children Part 2, right? Um, so, did the Six Children actually end up continuing the work of the Second Children? Did the Six Children attempt to build the tower that was supposed to return Mother to the Heavens? If they did, they failed as well. Um, yeah, I don't think it matters all that much. You can pronounce it Mew, Moo... Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think it matters all that much. Um, so the question is, why does it have special significance? I mean, the background music for Chamber of Extinction is even titled Moo. Um, and so I think it's kind of, this is another one where I just don't have an answer, right? I don't have a really good 
explanation for why there is a special significance between Mu and Palenque. Is Mu actually not the tower that was supposed to fly to the heavens? Maybe it's just like the flying machines that they were said to have created. Maybe it was like Palenque's ship. Or maybe it's something else entirely. Or maybe it's just a general homage to the second children. I don't necessarily have uh, a great... Um, I, don't, I don't really have a great answer here. Um, only instance of Islamic mythology here. Uh, what's the specific... Oh, the, the Islamic star. Got it. Okay. Um, so it's just the iconography. Got it. Cool. Um, I just, I think it's, I think it's interesting. Um, it's possible that the answer is just the, the, the mantra Mu doesn't have any special significance when try, when you try to tie it to the six children. Maybe that's the answer. Um, but I am trying to draw blood from a stone here and see if, um, if there's something that connects, and, and I, I don't really see it all that much. Um, yeah, it could absolutely be, again, instead of thinking about it as uh, necessarily just the flying machine, going back to the whole idea of, of unasking the question or asking the wrong question, which would definitely um, follow the theme of the six children lacking purpose. Yeah, those are all really great observations, and I, I, think, I think they're all perfectly valid and interesting. Yeah, that's actually another great example, uh, or another great answer, um, is that uh, because the the mantras were designed by the seven children, um, any any correlation could be just a misinterpretation by the seven children, or authorial bias, or editorial mistakes, or something like that. But anyway, this is one that I don't want to dwell on too much because I think the answer is ultimately like. Every theory is great, and I think all of your theories are great. And if you have a different theory than me, or you don't agree with one of mine, I can live with it. So the next one is V. Uh, v is the mantra used to strike V's wedge. Um, the text says, Chant these words, the name of the hideous demon that lurks in the land. The hideous demon whose eyelids droop to the ground, V. And I don't really have a lot to say here, but I, I, I want to take a moment and say to you, how can you call this guy hideous? Look at him. I'm sorry. I love this guy. How, you look at that picture down there and you tell me that he's hideous. Absolutely, absolutely unbelievable that someone would say that about V. Um, I included a picture of one of the um, one of the Cyclopses from Tower of the Goddess, and I did it because uh, someone in Discord, Cat Mike's. Um, mentioned uh, a theory they had. I thought it, I, I really thought it was a great one. I don't see how it fits into anything else, but I think it's a fantastic theory that the Cyclopses very possibly could be like um, a, a evolution of V, like related to V. Looks just like it. Uh, the coloring makes sense. The shape makes sense. Uh, it's just, it's so closely stylized to the look of V at least from the manual, then it's hard not to see it, really. As soon as someone points out to you that the Cyclops looks like V, I, I can't say it doesn't. So, um... So, so I'm, I'm gonna leave it at that note. Uh, I don't have any overarching theory about what that means otherwise. Um, but I just, I think it's, I think it's really interesting. Uh, it would be third children, but yeah, why why are there demons associated with uh, with helping V? Um, I, v is one of the few that I don't have an answer for, like, what generation uh, he falls in. Um, he's definitely a giant, so it points toward possibly being uh, second or sixth. And my gut tells me to lean more towards second because... Um, the Inferno Caverns were built by the Second Children, um, but I don't. I just don't have a good answer. I don't think it's great. Um, is V? Yeah, I guess V is a demon. That I that is a good reason to point at the Third Children. But I feel like the Third Children are are, are heavily indicated to be specifically winged creatures. If you ain't got wings, you're out of here. Um, maybe that's not true. Maybe I'm 
reading it too literally. Um, but I, I, again, I think this is another one of those things that um, it ultimately doesn't matter, but it's just fascinating to, to think about. <laughs> Those little tentacles or wings, not useful. Uh, they're supposed to be eyelashes um, of some sort, uh, but I, I, I love every theory I hear, and the thought that those are just, like, mutated wings, like, they're wings that did not, didn't form correctly, is, I love it. I, I don't hate any theory I hear. I love every theory I hear. Yeah, vestigial wings. There you go. Anyway, next one. Uh, Barun. Uh, so, the the uh, mantra number five is Barun, uh, and it is used to strike Bahamut's wedge. And the text says, Chant these words, the name of the turbulent seas of that land, the name of the deep, dark sea where Bahamut lives, Barun. Um, and I think it's easy to just throw this one right out the window, um, as being so obvious because Bahamut's Ankh is positioned at the top of Baron's waterfall from the surface. And if if you like that answer, there's a free one. That one's on the house. Um, but I think that you can actually go a little bit deeper than that. We already talked about how Bahrain was uh, possibly a transliteration of... Uh, sorry, that Bahrain was possibly a transliteration of Bahrain. Um, and it does come from the same part of the world as the Bahamut story and would um, sort of coincide with that theory of um, Bar, uh, of, of, of um, Bahrun being the Persian Gulf. Uh, Bar, B-A-H-R in Arabic, um, means sea, as far as I understand. And so it's probably referring to the Persian Gulf. Uh, I, I've done a lot of research to try to confirm that, Glumbaron. I, I tried to find somewhere, some text that just said, Bahrun is the name of something. And I have not found any text that confirms that. If that's true, I love it. And I want that to be true. I haven't found that myself, but I believe you. I, I believe anyone who says that. Um, specifically, this depiction, by the way, of, of um, Bahamut, the common depiction, is that... Uh, Bahamut is the fish that sort of supports the world, and on his back is the bull Kujata, supporting um, an angel with wings that holds up the sky, kind of like an Atlas-style figure. Um, that's that's what I've got for you there. Um, yeah, it's all Bahamut. It's all the way down. Next up, we've got... Uh, Wedjet. So mantra number six is Wedjet, and it is the mantra that is used to strike Elmac's wedge. And I think this one's going to surprise you. Uh, the text says, Chant these words, those eyes that gaze upon the truth, the name of those all-seeing eyes that grant divine protection, Wedjet. I gotta tell you, that description does not sound to me like it is describing the Eye of Horus. It specifically sounds like it's describing the Eye of Retribution, which, if you're not familiar with La Milana... Throughout the ruins, any attempt to harm the ruins in any way, striking a, a pyramid, hitting something you're not supposed to hit, attacking something you're not supposed to attack, um, causes the Eye of Retribution to shock you. It, um, it, uh, it zaps you. Um, and it sounds like it's describing those. Uh, which, first off, I'm just going to propose that's what Wedjet is. You remember, you may re recall... If you go back to my discussion about the fifth children, when I said that this slide depicts Wedjet, well, I wasn't lying, but I also knew where I was going with this. I never said that that Eye of Horus in the middle was Wedjet. There is a Wedjet pictured on this slide. So there you go. There's my little playing games with you. Just having, just having some fun. You know, I'm just out here moving and having fun. Oh, I know that the Eye of Horus is a wedge jet in real life. I get that. But I'm saying that in the game, in La Mulana, in La Mulana lore, it is specifically said 
that those eyes that gaze upon the truth, the name of those all-seeing eyes that grant divine protection is Wedjet. That eye is called Wedjet. I think that it's worth asking the question. Again, we're, we're, we're heavily into speculative territory, trying to bleed... <laughs> We're trying to we're trying to draw water from a stone here, uh, with very little text and trying to take some meaning from it. But um, if Wedjet was from the fifth children, the Eye of Horus was from the fifth children. Does that mean that the fifth children specifically were the ones that added the eyes to the ruins? Possibly. Um, I don't I don't uh, think that that's not right. But there's nothing in there's no other text that would to, that would support the fifth children specifically being responsible for adding the eyes of Wedjet, the 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 eyes of retribution throughout the ruins. All right, next up, we have mantra number seven, Abuto. Abuto is the mantra that is used to strike Sakit's wedge. The text specifically says, chant these words, the name of the one who tells of the giant sorrows, the name of the one who watched the fall of a race and shed tears, Abuto. Now, if you look at one of the tablets in um, Mausoleum of the Giants, it specifically is signed Abuto. Now, we know that Mausoleum of the Giants wasn't built by the second children. So, was that information cribbed from somewhere else? Did Abuto write this text, but it was put on the tablets later? Maybe. That might be the answer. But, as far as we're concerned, the story of the brothers is presumably told by Abuto. Right? We know that the story of the brothers was told by Abuto. Um, in order to have any meaningful discussion of Abuto... Uh, I would have to dance around La Milana 2 stuff, and we are continuing to dance around La Milana 2 stuff. And so I'm going to avoid it here. I do think it's kind of interesting um, to note um, that Abuto is, has his back to his brothers and he's facing away. Um, I don't know whether or not that means anything. I think, I think this is sort of like me pulling on the text too much, pulling on the information too much. But I think it's interesting to note that Abuto has his back to his brothers. And if you've played La Milana 2, you know that there's more story about the giants and that Abuto comes up. And uh, this is this is the one place I warned early on that I was going to make a small mention of La Milana 2. I'm not going to spoil anything in La Milana 2, but I, I do want to mention that in the plot of La Milana 2, it does point out that Abuto wasn't a great guy that that there was something wrong with him he 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 uh he did he did he did hey he did bad okay and so i think that there might be something to read here with abuto facing away from his brothers It, it is worth saying, though, um, this is not going to be La Malona 2 spoilers, but it, I'm going to continue riffing on this idea. Um, these are ideas that I, I'm only capable of having once I start talking about this, because I've never thought about this before. But did the six children know that Abuto was a bad guy? Because they were the ones who built the statue. They were the ones who would have faced him away. If I'm going to read into this and say that him facing away is supposed to be some sort of admonition of Abuto... Did the six children know about this? Did the six children know about what Abuto did wrong? And how would they have known? Anyway, there's my thoughts. All right. <clears throat> so mantra number eight is La Mulana. It is the mantra that is used to strike Amphispina's wedge. And the text says, Chant these words, the name of the one who started everything, and grant them eternal slumber as the last child with La Mulana. Now, I think you could read this a number of different ways, but I think the way I like to read this the best is the very obvious thing that if you hear this, 
I think for many of you, most of you, if you're like me, you will think to yourself simultaneously, well, obviously, and oh my gosh, that's so cool. Uh, did you realize that the mother has a name? Her name is La Mulana. Like, yeah, no, duh. The ruins are called La Mulana, and the ruins are the mother. So of course she has a name. Her name is La Mulana. But have you ever put? Have you ever said those two things together? Anyway, if you if you beat me to that and you're like, yeah, obviously that's the case, then great. Have a have a gold star. I don't know. All right, so here's the mural that represents the history of La Mulana, and I'm gonna give you a minute to see. We're gonna we're gonna do the BuzzFeed quiz. Like, how many how many things can you spot in the history mural? So now that you are an expert on the history of La Mulana, we've covered quite a lot at this point. How many things can you spot? And well, you've already done it, Trelv. You don't have to do it anymore. But I'm just asking you. Take a moment. Take a look at it. You don't have to type them into chat. I just want you to take a moment and look at this really closely and see how many references you can spot. I'm going to overlay them in a moment so you can see these references. <clears throat> but I just want you to see if you can spot everything. I've, I've included, by the way, in the top right, uh, the original La Mulana classic uh, history mural. Um, this That, that was uh, provided to me by someone on Discord. I didn't have that image at the ready. If you're anything like me, and I imagine some of you are, if you're anything like me, you've probably looked at this mural a bunch of times, you know, like if you if you've ever if you played La Mulana, you walk right past it, you don't think much of it. But have you ever really just inspected it? So I'm going to give you a moment more to take a look at this. Try to make a mental note of everything you recognize in this picture. Even even the minutia. And I'm going to put them all on screen and you see if you found everything I found. Please. Please, Borzoi. Please. Please do not point out the Amogus in the picture. I need you to not point out the Amogus. I know where it is. I see it. Please do not point it out. Okay. Here you go. Here's everything. <clears throat> so some things moved from where they were on the tablet or on the mural in Classic. We've got the, on the left hand side, we've got the secret treasure of life. We've got the holy grail and the vessel. We've got the wedge jet down in the bottom left. Uh, we have a giant statue of, it, it may not be the mother. It's the likeness that is used within the ruins of the mother. Um, so when you go to fight the mother in the shrine of the mother, that statue is the, the first phase. So we've seen that before. There's the tree of life. My favorite is, and it's very hard to see until you kind of, look at it against the actual etching from the Moo tablet, but it does look like it's a little rocket ship shape pointing at the the sun, but it's kind of squished down. So if you if you can't see it, imagine that you just take that image and just squish it down, like to a third of its height. Not scaled, squished. And you can start to see it a little bit. You got the four philosophers. Uh, you have the sun and the moon pyramid at the top. Um, they're connected. You have two in La Mulanis in that, in that uh, circle. If you don't know how to read La Mulanis, I would have accepted uh, some number in a, in a marker. Uh, we've got a giant second child. The second child... So, so here's my thing about that being a second child. Um, it's holding a pochette key in its hand, which tells me that maybe it was intended to be a sixth child. But 
I think more interesting um, is to think of it as a second child because the the shape of the head is the same as the shape of the statues that are in in um, <clears throat> in the mausoleum of the giants. I think the much more interesting thing to say is why did I not write Sakit next to it, right? Because obviously it's Sakit. I don't think it's Sakit. I do not. Um, I think that it's actually Abuto. And my reason is, is because he's standing over the four philosophers, kind of pointing. He's like, he's like indicating, he's showing them something. And Abuto was the one who wrote the history of the second children. And so my theory is that that's actually Abuto. There, there seems to be a little bit of like um, uh, like a trim of fish right above the four philosophers, and one of the things that I didn't mention in here, I didn't, I didn't want to just like draw over it on the picture, is that right above Mu, to the left of the four philosophers, if you look really closely, you can see what's fairly clearly um, a few items from the game. Um, now, if you look on the classic tablet in the top right, you can see them so much more obviously. You can see the lamp, you can see the Jed Pillar, the Magatama, the Ocarina. Um, I think this is a worthwhile point to stop and circle back and say, did the philosophers create these treasures? Well, yeah, obviously the philosophers create these treasures because they built the puzzles and the challenges that you face. And that instantly brings me back to thinking about Dracuet saying that he was not able to become a philosopher because his inventions, his creations didn't get noticed. And so I think it's I think it's possible that the implication here is that to be a philosopher you have to have created something. I don't, I don't know necessarily whether or not I think uh, each of these treasures can be directly mapped to one of the philosophers in particular. I, I'd love to hear some theories about that, but I don't have, um, I don't have any idea what, um, what treasure would correspond to which. Yeah, I guess if everyone else is creating like a lamp that stops time or a pillar that allows you to chant ancient words and you create a bikini, um, then maybe that doesn't quite, you know, it's like, it's just, it just doesn't qualify. I don't know though. I mean, am I, am I about to be on record saying that I don't think the bikini should have been invented? I don't think I'm on, I don't think I'm willing to be on the record saying that. All right, so that's our history mural. Whew, that was a, a long one. We're not done yet, though. Let's talk about the eighth children. And at this point, I have to warn you one more time, we are entering into wild speculation. So, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what stuff has uh, some basis in the text, but it's not much. A lot of this is going to be... Um... Yeah, uh, if you're talking about... Um picture beside the vessel look like the twins oh you're talking about this right here i can see that yeah it looks like two guys with tails yeah i'm i'm definitely into that theory it's very hard to see but i i could see that i could see two dudes with tails that being the twins yeah no doubt about it i'm not convinced by any answer about what this is um i've heard a few theories about this being like the split gates pictured inside of a circle i don't love that one uh, I just haven't heard an answer for this about, uh, about what that is that I like. Is that the looping pit in the chamber of birth? I mean, again, it's an answer that, okay, but I don't, I don't necessarily know. Um, it's tough. It's, it's tough to answer, but I think, uh, it's really interesting.
It's the mother's... If you're talking about, um... Hold on, hold on, let me squint at it for a second. Are you saying that this is supposed to be her face between the split gates at the at the start of the fight? I'm not sure I quite see that. Oh, the final phase. Oh my god, that is the final phase. Thank you! We figured it out! That's it! It's the split gates with the fetus. That's it. That, without a doubt. I believe that one 100%. Yeah, I'm into that. I'm into that answer. No, we will never point out the Amogus. Thank you for asking. Anyway, let's talk about the eighth children. Again, like I said before, we're, we're, we're branching into, like, wild speculation at this point. Um, and I'll, I'll do my best to point out um, places where the text maybe supports my theory. But just know that a lot of what I'm about to say is, is my speculation. S there will be one point of speculation coming up that I'm just going to tell you at that time that La Mulana 2 confirms, right? It's going to be speculative from this perspective, but La Mulana 2 confirms it and all the details point to it. So just be prepared for that. I won't, I'm not going to spoil La Mulana 2. All the point, all the, all the details are in La Mulana 1. I'm just going to tell you that that thing isn't speculation. All right, eighth children. Uh, if you are an eighth child, feel free to wave. Um, th this is you. This is your chance to wave. Uh, you are an eighth child. Uh, we were born of the seventh children. Um, so this this was a process by the seventh children. We were given... Str I, I keep saying we, but you know what I mean. The, the eighth children were given strength and knowledge, but importantly had no knowledge of the mother. And apparently this was an extremely significant detail. Um, apparently this was the one secret power necessary um to finally do what needed to be done uh yeah the eighth children were going to be destroyed in 2015 we dodged that bullet thank god um oh no i just thought that was funny to include in a slide sorry sorry that was just funny to include in the slide <laughs> um but i ultimately the question is why was that detail important right like, why is it important that we have no knowledge of the mother? The seventh children clearly were able to set every single piece into place to kill the mother. They they outfitted the ruins with these fantastic machines and puzzles and things. They set all the lore in place. And yet, what was stopping them from just pulling the trigger? Like, why could they not do it? They had a gun on the surface. The gun wasn't inside the ruins. They had the gun. I don't know. I, I, I've talked about this question a bunch of times. Why was that detail specifically important? And I feel like it gets brushed off a lot. A lot of people just say, like, knowing the mother makes you impossible to kill her. Which is like, that's such cyclic reasoning, right? Why do you need to not know about the mother in order to kill the mother? Because knowing about the mother prevents you from killing the mother. That is literally the definition of begging the question. So I, I don't know. I, I think it's interesting to ask the question, like, why was that the missing piece? That was the one detail that was needed. Um, I don't necessarily think that there's an answer. I don't think that there is an answer here. Um, I think that there is something else that's going to answer a totally different question that might help answer this, but we'll get to that. So what role did the Guardians play? So the text says, eight spirits dwell within this land. The spirits are guardians, protectors of these grounds. The spirits slumber within the onks that will shatter under the bright red light. The spirits will awaken at that time. So the question is, who made the guardians? Did the mother make the guardians or did the philosophers make the guardians? Because if the mother knew the plot, knew that the wedges were going to be what would make her corporeal, then her creating the guardians to protect those wedges makes sense. That works. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm comfortable with that answer, uh, but I think a lot more textual evidence points towards the philosophers making the guardians, such as the guardians that slumber within the Ankh will test thine strength. You know, the seven children specifically made these tests. So I think that it's, 
I think it's easier to point toward the answer being... What did it mean? What what did it mean uh, to have these guardians? Who made them? Um, I think it also kind of leads into... And here's the part where I'm going to tiptoe into a theory that if Lama Lama 2 didn't exist would sound absolutely wild. Um, but it is confirmed by Lama Lana 2. So here it comes. Here's the thing that is entirely backed by Lama Lana 1, but that Lama Lana 2 more or less confirms. And that's that if the red lights were created by the the philosophers, right? The 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 philosophers created all of these tools, created the Ankh jewels, created the key sword, created the Ankhs that sealed away the... If we accept for a moment that the philosophers created this challenge, then what does the red light mean? And why does it keep reappearing in some really strange places? Why is there a red light on the mother's face? Why is there a red light on Tiamat's face? Why is there a red light on Baphomet's face? We come to find out through La Milana 2, this is not a... A, this is a this is a, a, a plot spoiler for La Milana 2, but it's not a puzzle spoiler or anything like that. Um, we come to find out, through the course of things, exactly what La Milana 1 was pointing at. Which is that, this is not actually Tiamat. This is not actually Baphomet. And very possibly, that's not actually the mother. Maybe there is no mother. La Milana 2 confirms that this isn't Tiamat. And in a roundabout way, La Milana 2 confirms that that's not Baphomet. But if we extrapolate that data all the way out, if we, if we follow that detail to its very conclusion, the red light on the mother's face might be indicating the exact same thing. So my thought is that the red light indicates that it's a creation of the seven, uh, the the seven children, the philosophers, and for that reason, I think that that's not the real Skanda. I'm not willing to support that really any other way, but I mean, there's sort of a lot to unpack here, right? So the question is like, is the Tiamat is is the Tiamat is Tiamat made in the mother's image, or is she imitating the mother? Is that why she has the red light? Or, if the red light is the creations of the philosophers, is it possible that Tiamat, this isn't the real Tiamat? Is it possible that this isn't the real Baphomet? And ultimately, we can only know the actual answer to this through Lamalan 2 confirming it, but the answer is, yeah, that's not actually Tiamat, and that's not actually Baphomet. That's not to say that Tiamat and Baphomet weren't real. That's to say that these aren't them. And for that reason, it's possible that that's not actually the mother. And if that's not the mother, if the mother was the creation of the philosophers, what was the point of all of this? Yeah, I'm, I'm totally willing to believe that the red light on the face of the mother statue is just an indication that that's how the seven children sealed her away. So it may I may be grasping way too far, but there is some credence to the theory, right? Uh, my last mention of La Milana 2 here is going to be that it's heavily implied that the cre or that the the ruins themselves were more or less tourism bait, um, and so for that reason, it's very possible that the creation of the mother and the creation of all of these creatures were really just like tourism. I think all of these ideas. Are valid. The one that I think is really, really reaching is the one about the mother. If if you feel like that's a step too far, if you feel like the mother is not a creation of the seventh philosophers, we're good. I don't even feel strongly about that idea. 
But I think it's interesting to think about. So ultimately, if we if we consider for a moment that the mother didn't create the guardians, which I believe strongly is indicated by the text. Mother did not create the guardians. The guardians were uh, created by the seventh children uh, as part of the ritual process to kill, or as a part of the ritual process to, to kill the mother. Then what is the relationship between the mother and the guardians? Because during the mother fight in the last phase, each time a certain damage threshold is reached, the mother absorbs the soul of one of the guardians. Now, it could be something quite simple. It could be that the mother's soul is really taking on, like, the spirit of a generation. That, feel, that felt like a Pepsi ad. Spirit of a generation. But really, like, taking on, like, a whole generation of children. But if we think of it as specifically individual guardians, if we think of it as individual guardians are being absorbed here, how does the mother have any relationship with these guardians? The text of La Milana specifically says, let us place the spirit of the ninth child into the body of child zero, which, uh, aside from just being the tagline for La Milana 2, the, the tagline for La Milana 2 is zeroth body, ninth spirit, um, also does indicate kind of what's going on here, and that's that this, this fetus that appears at the very end of the fight is kind of the next generation of, of children. I guess the mother has the power again to create children, and she's kind of using its power to enrich herself as one last uh, one last bid to to win this battle. She doesn't want to die. Um. I don't really have a whole lot more to think about that. I, I just kind of wanted to propose it. It might it might suggest that whatever created the guardians created the mother as well it might lend credence to that theory but i present it um with no real defense my last thing isn't really an observation for lore but just kind of an interesting thing to point out i don't have an answer about this but if you look at the true shrine of the mother if you look at all the maps tiled together you can notice that all these roots, I think a lot of times people refer to them as tentacles, but all these roots appear to emanate from the mother onk. And the question is ultimately, what are these roots? Um, are they biological? Are they organic? Is this like the side effect of the mother becoming corporeal? Is that she's like rooted in the shrine of the mother? I don't know. I just think it's cool. Um, I think it's really cool to see pictured seeing all of the roots and the way that they they map out over the course of the ruins and, and notice that they directly all emanate from Thong. Sure, that's a great point. The, the Shrine of the Mother is shaped like a person. There's two extra rooms that I didn't include in this photo just because they don't really have uh, um, the roots that... that help this this um point along but uh they could be like hands on the arms so yeah it could be a tree of life tie-in it could just be like th exactly as was said uh, the whole idea of like a heart inside of a body which is exactly what the mother is she's she's a soul inside of by the way i i didn't really mention this i i will mention this uh one time and that's i think it's a complicated question to address um, exactly what the nature of the ruins is. Um, it's mentioned by the philosophers that the the ruins are the body of the mother, right? That that's her flesh. Um, I think that that I think that I'm willing to interpret that as some um, poetic license. Um, my interpretation of what happened is that a meteor came to Earth um, and inside of it was the soul of this creature, the mother. 
Um, but it's not like it's the mother's body. It's just the the meteor that was encasing her. So I I don't personally subscribe to the theory that the 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 ruins are like flesh of a creature. I think it's just a meteor that has a soul. Whatever that means, it's a it's a meteor that has a soul, and um, I think I think it's really interesting to reframe a lot of the idea of like carving out these fields from that body in that way. Um, yeah, it could just be like an interstellar ship that crashed. Um, I just think, I, I think it's kind of interesting to point out that, uh, there may be a lot of poetic license in that idea right there. So anyway, with that, uh, here's my special thanks slide. Um, if you, if you, uh, so in no particular order, here's a list of people who, um, allowed me to constantly annoy them uh, in in my Discord about weird La Milana questions that were ultimately pointless. Um, I've also included a thank you for Emily and Ty Tuesday because I absolutely stole this idea from them. When I saw Emily did that cool lore stream for Destiny 2, I was like, that sounds like a fun way to go about doing this. And so I... Um, I decided to do this as well. Um, and if your name didn't appear here, I'm sorry if I missed anyone that I would have liked to have mentioned. Uh, but honestly, anyone who's ever allowed me to like talk at them endlessly about La Milana stuff, I appreciate you. It helps me um, sometimes when I've got a wild thought that I want to um, explore. <clears throat> it helps me to have people to to humor my strange hyper fixations. And, and thank you. Uh, many of you have been here for three hours now. I did not anticipate this being three hours. Um, thank you for being here and listening to me talk about La Milana, I guess. It's a video game. Who cares? Yeah, I specifically decided not to go into the weeds on things like all the architectural references, for which there are a lot, and uh, the backgrounds of all the character, all the creatures throughout the runes. I, I could probably do that sometime. My brain needs a break because I've been obsessing over this slide deck I've been making for like several weeks now. I've just been obsessing. I've been obsessing constantly. Uh, so I need a little bit of a break from it. But I, I would definitely be down to do. Um, a discussion of some of the the references um, that La Milana uses to fill out its own mythology. Um, and maybe at some point, I'll do La Milana 2 as well. I think La Milana 2 is really interesting. I think uh, the problem is, is that there's a lot of interesting things to speculate about in La Milana 1, and there's just not as much in La Milana 2. Lamalana 2 just kind of tells you how it is. You don't have, uh... You don't have weird interpretive structure. You don't have unreliable narrators because everyone just says what they're actually thinking and writes it down on tablets. It's just, it's not... It's not as easy to kind of dive into in the same way. As worse put it, La Milana is very wordy. Or, sorry, La Milana 2 is very wordy. La Milana 2 is not afraid to just, like... What's, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's, not, it's not afraid to just talk at you for, like, ten screens in a row and say, I'm sure you have no questions now. Expo yeah, exposit was actually the word I was looking for. Just doing tons of exposition. That actually was the word I was looking for.
<laughs> When's the exam? Your exam was midway through. I've already graded it and it wasn't great. That was your exam. Is there a place that has the 4x5 versions of the maps? Uh, no, not that I know of. Um, Worse made one for um, two zones. I've seen a bunch of them for a few zones, but I just, um, I don't know of any. I don't know of them being um, just like available to look at. Okay, um, I'm going to pause and give my voice a rest for like five minutes. Where can you find the slot? Uh, it's not public. I mean, I can make it public if y'all want it, but it's, um... I'm gonna give my voice like a five minute rest, and um, then I'm going to um, come back and probably play some Might and Magic. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll make it available. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll link to it on YouTube or something. Send Naramura the slideshow. I think Naramura would just shake his head at this, um, at this presentation. I think he'd be like, I cannot believe that people are wasting their life on this video game. Oh, is that supposed to be V? I can believe that that's V. I don't... I don't see it clearly, but, like, if you told me that that's supposed to be V, I, I buy it. No, no, I know I know the one you're talking about. The Amogus. Anyway... Um, thank you for, thank you for your attention, <laughs> and I'll, uh, I'll be back in like five minutes. My voice desperately needs a rest. I may do that, I may do that, Squidly.